four, three, two, one. And ladies and gentlemen of the jury, the prosecution is not going to get that man today. No, because I'm going to get him. This is the Hagman and Hagman Report for today. It is a manic Monday. It is the 20th day of May 2013. I'm Doug Hagman. Co-host with me is my son, Joe Hagman. Also co-host together. We are the Hagman and Hagman Report. And for the next three hours, I hope you stay with us. You're going to be hearing some very uncensored, unbiased news analysis and information that you need to know you're listening to the only show where the news folks is presented to you in 3d we look beyond the news beyond the beyond the news headlines i should say beyond the bylines beyond the sound bites beyond the uh the uh, pretty faces bringing you the news and we bring you the news that's important to you behind the news we broadcast live each and every weeknight from 8 to 11 p.m eastern time you can find us on the internet at our home base, homelandsecurityus.com. We're also simulcast by the Christians United Broadcasting Network, and you can tune into the show at the Hagman and Hagman Report.com, all spelled out, the Hagman and Hagman Report.com, all spelled out. And of course, Hagman is with two N's, like Nancy. I want to thank each and every one of you for joining us. We've heard from people this weekend, Calgary, Alberta, Canada, Nova Scotia, new listeners, Kansas City, Kansas, Amarillo, Texas, Jacksonville, Florida, and for the new listeners as well, listening live in the Philippines, and I'm not sure how we did this, but Morocco. Interesting. I want to say welcome to the Hagman and Hagman Report. I want to thank each and every one of you for your belief and your trust in us as we walk through this minefield together. Joe, what is going on on your end of the studio today? Oh, I'm just running around fields, picking daisies and hopping over rainbows. You know me. <laughs> exactly. We, we got a lot of news. Uh, want to immediately ask for your prayers for the people in the Oklahoma City area that um, suffered one of the most horrendous, I guess the biggest tornado in history that uh it's just unbelievable damage well, certainly we need to we need to pray for them for their families we need to pray for the first responders we need to pray for the people affected by this horrendous storm and uh there's been several uh, storms throughout the weekend from yeah. friday on ripping through texas and oklahoma oklahoma being the latest as dozens of children are feared dead Winds of 166 to 200 miles an hour, a mile and a half wide tornado. Uh, it's just shattering everything in its path, and we definitely need to keep those people in our prayers, their families, the communities around them. And this is why we stress preparedness so much, because it doesn't take a end-of-the-world type scenario to need to be prepared. Exactly. And if you're, uh, let's say, in the outer periphery of the storm and you lose power or, you know, you, you have, or if even if you're within that area and you're limited to travel because of debris, because of, just because, look, it, you need to be prepared. And um, whether it's food, water, uh, clothing, extra medicine, don't forget pet food. You know, for your pets, and a way to defend yourself too, your property, especially if the police are otherwise indisposed. So, you know, when we talk about preparedness, yes, Joe, you're exactly right. We talk about preparedness in the sense that anything could happen. And I just have to say this: I look at this. You know, I I was talking with somebody today who said, "Well, you know, tornadoes happen. Well, of course they happen." Storms happen, earthquakes happen, uh, a lot of things happen. But 
are we not seeing perhaps the wrath being poured out over the United States? Now, I, I know that I'll get some emails saying, well, you're crazy, you're, you're just... But, but, I mean, think about this. Um, we can go back in history and look at certain things we've done and certain things that have happened that can be attributed to nature. I'm sure they could. And, and, and you know what? Maybe they are. Maybe, maybe they are. But then again, maybe they're not. But regardless... Um, it's a, it's, a, it's a discussion I certainly don't, don't want to have tonight, but I uh, just want to, uh, again, remind everyone to, uh, please, when you hit your knees tonight, of course you can thank God it didn't happen to you, but of course you can also pray for those hurt, those that didn't make it, and pray for the people who are dealing with the aftermath of this terrible storm and the storms throughout the weekend. We've got a lot of news to cover tonight, and I believe we do have a guest for the second hour. Do we not? Yes, we do. Okay. And this gentleman, by the way, is going to be talking. The, the, the topic uh, for this gentleman tonight is going to be immigration and border control, immigration enforcement, border control. J just in case you've heard of this man before and you have issues with this man or you don't or it or you've never heard of him, whatever, but it, the, the topic is going to be immigration and border enforcement. And I think he can bring a lot to the table in terms of the numbers he has. He's spent a lifetime researching that kind of stuff. His name is Fos Frosty Woolridge, Forrest Woolridge. He's written uh, uh, numerous articles for News with Views, and he's unliked by the Southern Loverty, uh, yes, yeah, Southern Loverty, Southern Poverty Law Center, and other places. So. Uh, bring him on. We'll we'll talk to him for an hour. Find out what's on his mind with respect to immigration and uh, border enforcement. And yeah. just as an aside, I'll, I'll be on uh, coast to coast talking about the ammunition shortage uh, tonight, just during the news segment. And Wednesday night. Yeah, Wednesday is we're gonna have a very special program Wednesday night with uh, Pastor Langford and Steve Quayle. Remember that program we did with the uh, communion. The first time, probably in radio history, you've ever, we've ever had a mass communion. Uh, we're gonna be doing that again this Wednesday, but a little bit more, a little bit special. I didn't have a chance to update the uh, website here the last couple of days. I've been otherwise preoccupied with certain things, which we'll get into later. But um, it's gonna be a, it's gonna be a good show Wednesday with Steve Quayle and uh, Pastor David Langford. Uh, it's the uh, Steve Quill has it on his website at stevequill.com in the alerts section. You can get you can find out all about what we're going to be talking about. That's right, and we're going to uh, hit some news stories here. Obviously, we're going to get into the weather and what is developing in Oklahoma as it happens, and we get more information in real time. We're going to open with this first. I want to play an audio that was had come out over the weekend. An Obama aide, Dan Pfeiffer. And this goes to what my father has been talking about for weeks. A main point on the Benghazi situation that was not addressed. And this it was Dan, not right. important he, 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 in the minds of most. This what you're hearing is you're hearing is uh, Sunday morning talk show Chris Wallace interviewing this uh, this uh, spokesperson for this administration. Yeah, Chris Wallace uh, interviews Mr. Pfeiffer, and it is about the Benghazi attacks, Obama's handling of them, and where he was during the time they were unfolding. She did anything wrong? Okay. Let's turn to to Benghazi, and I want to ask you about one lingering question, which is the president's actions on 9-11, the night of the attack, because we don't know very much about that. We do know that in the afternoon, he had an already scheduled meeting with Defense Secretary Panetta, as well as the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, General Martin Dempsey. When he heard about this while they were in a meeting on an unrelated subject, he said that he wanted them to deploy forces as soon as possible. The next time that he shows up is that Hillary Clinton says that she spoke to him at around 10 o'clock that night after the attack at the consulate, not as it turned out at the annex, but the attack at the consulate was had ended. Question, what did the president do the rest of that night to pursue Benghazi? Well, the, look, the president was kept up to date on this as it was happening throughout the entire night from the moment it started until the very end. And because this is critically, this is a horrible tragedy. These are people that he sent 
uh, abroad whose lives are in risk, people who work for him. And I recognize that there's a series of conspiracy theories that Republicans have been spinning about this since the night it happened. But the, there has been an independent review of this. Congress has held hearings. We provided 250,000 pages of 25,000 pages of documents up there. There have been 11 hearings, 20 staff briefings, and everyone has found the same thing. This is a tragedy. And so the question here is not what happened that night. The question is what are we going to do to move forward and ensure that this doesn't happen again? That's why Congress should act on what the president called for earlier this week to, to pass legislation to allow us to actually implement all the recommendations of the independent accountability board so we can protect our diplomats around the country, around the world, because when we send our diplomats off into far-flung places, there is an, an inherent level of risk. We should do what we can to mitigate that risk. But with due respect, you didn't answer my question. What did the president do that night? He was, kept, he, he was in, in constant touch that night with his national security team and kept up to date with the events as they were happening. Well, you say his national security team, he didn't talk to the Secretary of State, except for the one time when the first attack was over. He didn't talk to the Secretary of Defense. He didn't talk to the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs. Who was he talking to? He was talking to his, his national security staff, his national security council, or the people who would keep him up to date about it, these things as they happen. Was he in the Situation Room? He was kept up to date throughout the day. Do you not know whether he was in the situation? I don't, I don't remember what room the president was in on that night. That's, that's a largely irrelevant fact. Well, the point is, the, the question is, the premise of your question is that somehow so there was something that could have been done differently, okay, that would have changed the outcome here. The Accountability Review Board has looked at this. People have looked at it. It's a horrible tragedy what happened, and we have to just make sure it doesn't happen here, again. Here's the point, though. The ambassador goes missing. It ends up the first ambassador in more than 30 years is killed. Four Americans including the ambassador, are killed. Dozens of Americans are in jeopardy. The president at 4 o'clock in the afternoon says to the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, deploy forces. No forces are deployed. Where is he while all this is going on? I, this has been testified to by the... Well, no. No one knows where he was or how he was involved or who told him there were no forces. The, the, suggestion, the suggestion of your question is that somehow the president... Uh, I just, want, this I just to want to know what the answer is. That, that's a, the, the assertions from Republicans here that somehow this, that the president allowed this to happen or didn't take action is offensive. It is absolutely an it's offensive premise, and there's no evidence to support it. We just, I, I'm simply asking a question. Where was he? What did he do? How did he respond? When, how, who told him that you can't deploy forces, and what was his response? As to I said to you, the president was in the White House that day. He was kept up to date by his national security team. He spoke to the Secretary of Defense and the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs earlier. And the Later, and, and as events unfolded, he was kept up to date. Let me. Here's one. Of okay, folks, I, I've got some things to say on this. Uh, yeah, and in case uh, those who missed it, Obama A. Dan Pfeiffer was in an interview with uh, Chris Wallace, and Chris Wallace was asking him, you know, where was Obama that night? Was he talking to his national security staff? Was he with the Joint Chiefs? Was he talking to the Secretary Panetta? Was he in the Situation Room? And Pfeiffer said, I don't remember what room the president was in on that night. And that is a largely irrelevant fact. And that would be true if he was accounted for somewhere. Well, all right. Here's my position. I spoke with a, a good friend of mine in the intelligence world uh, right before the program got me fired up, and I'm not going to tell you something I am fired up because, y you know, we had talked, um, f first of all, with this Dan Pfeiffer. He never answered the question, where was Obama? Did he answer the question? No. How many times was he asked? How many different ways did he ask? But he never answered the question. He dodged the question. He's lying. You see, 30 years as an investigator, you don't even need 30. Look, the guy was lying. This is nothing more than dereliction of duty of a commander-in-chief of the armed forces. This guy was missing in action. Obama was missing in action. There's no other way to put it. We are not thinking big enough. The American people are not thinking big enough. We see a bunch of little scandals and treat and fall for this, this baloney that Benghazi is just a little scandal. No, it's not. It's a huge scandal. It's well beyond anything that we've seen in modern times. And this is how we're being treated. We are seeing the back end of Obama as he bows down to the Saudis. And we're being mooned by Obama, and they're laughing at us. And if you, folks, if you are not angry, then you're not paying attention. You've got to understand, 
They're laughing at you. Because you know why? Because you're not paying attention. Because they think you're stupid. They think I'm stupid. They think Joe is stupid. They think we're all stupid. They're laughing at you. And Obama is bearing his rear when he bows to the Saudi prince or king. This guy is a Saudi asset. We, look, do we need... What happened with Fast and Furious? Nothing. Holder needs to go. Holder needs to go. Should have never been there in the first place. Look, we don't need, we don't need a special uh, counsel. Uh, 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 you know what we need? We need an up and down vote for straight impeachment. Get this guy out of here. Our country is in peril. Our our country is in peril. How? Look, Syria, World War Three, hair trigger. Yeah, we need a fire hose through the White House. We need a fire hose through Congress. Look, our country is in peril. Syria right now is on a hair trigger. The dollar, the economy, the economy, folks. Do you understand what's going on? And I know our listeners do, our normal listeners do. But for the new listeners, do you understand how close we are to an economic collapse where there are dollar? And, and, and by the way, who in the world can justify a statement that they would just kill the dollar? Can you tell me that? Give me, that, give me a defensible argument about killing the dollar. Oh, well, when you kill the dollar, you'll kill the Federal Reserve. No, 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 no. You know, no, you don't understand. They're going to kill the dollar in the Federal Reserve. It's going to be a global Fed. We're going to lose our national sovereignty under this person. And here's the ultimate question. Here's the $64,000 question. Is Obama a president or is he a king? He can't be both. He's either answerable to the American public as his his as are his minions like this David uh, uh, Pukhauser, I don't know whatever his name is, or or or, or he's going to treat us like subjects. And right now, all I see is a moon facing us, a bow to the Saudis, and we're being treated like subjects. And I mean, I've had it. I've absolutely had it. This guy, if, if there is not one person in Congress that can't see this for what it is, and that's dereliction of duty, where lives were lost, people's lives were changed forever. The, the, the course of this country was changed forever over this Benghazi. If, if Chris Tingles uh, Matthews can't see this, What in the world? I, I mean, I, I, he's either blinded by by some sort of psychotic uh, love fest, or he's part of the problem. Definitely part of the problem, I would say. And when you're speaking in your uh, tone, there the lights started to dim in the basement. Which I thought they were going to explode because of your anger. <laughs> I was wondering what was going on there. Now you guys missed it. Uh, we have a lower level part where the studio actually is lower. Than the light started to dim out when he was yelling. No, but and you're apparently, right. Uh, apparently, I sucked the energy right out of the fluorescent bulbs. Yeah, you did. And we're seeing uh, another one of Obama's cronies, Bloomberg using a commencement speech to push gun control and rail against NRA extremists. You have uh, John Kerry going heading into the Middle East to get involved with peace talks between the Syrian rebels and the Assad regime. Yeah, I, I, stating, how do you think you know, this is going to go? If they don't come to an agreement, they're going to step up their efforts in helping the rebels, well, the okay. same rebels who are eating the hearts of Syrian soldiers, Syrian government soldiers. The same res rebels who, this weekend, the Western-backed rebels, 
fired upon civilian unarmed protesters in Damascus, killing several. I mean, this is our tax dollars at work. The same Syrian rebels who, backed by the Obama administration, European governments, and the Arab dictatorship, and other powerful elements of the establishment, are desperately trying to unseat Assad, even though they're not entirely clear or coherent in the reasons that they are doing so. And Syria is in an all-out civil war. Iraq is falling into a civil war. Many countries have been overthrown. Hundreds of thousands of needless civilian deaths are uh, have been brought upon uh, the countries we are attacking because of the actions of our government. We also have in other news Portugal bankers warn EU to stop playing with fire and this goes for the US too as concerns expressed by some of the top bankers that the treatment of Cyprus has set a new precedent and the result uh, in the region is reaching, reaching dangerous levels. Basically, it's coming out their plans of their controlled theft of the s civilians of this globe and their wealth. It's coming here. Look, if, if people don't get this by now, it's coming here. We have the, the Department dollar, of Homeland. The yeah, the dollar is going down the down the down the tubes, and it's it's being done um, maliciously, and it's uh, it's with treason, it's with with sedition, and um, just understand that what you're seeing in Cyprus, you're going to get a you, you know now I'm getting like Steve, okay? I've gotten emails. Well, what should I do with my 401k? If you're asking that question, folks, you're asking the wrong question. All right, yeah. go on. We also have news that the Department of Homeland Security is stepping up its work with local police to enforce martial law. Also, a new DHS self-study entitled Homeland Security and Intelligence, Next Step in Evolving the Mission, which in which DHS proclaims that they have or they are no longer concerned with foreign inspired terrorism. They're only focusing on domestic terrorism which are the American people, with 2.2 billion rounds of bullets, 2,700 armored vehicles, and hundreds of thousands of personnel being acquired over the last years. They are setting up from there to go forward with their agenda, the real agenda, the whole purpose behind creating the Department of Homeland Security, 9-11 being used as the mechanism to create it, to come after the American people as they did in Nazi Germany, really. Well, with uh, you the know, quasi police state SS let's talk black about this boots. For a minute. All right, let's talk about this for a minute. We had nine eleven. We had things that that led up to nine eleven. Of course, you had the you had the ninety three bombing, and then of course you had the the coal, the, the Cobar Tower. I mean, just a whole slew of things that led up to nine eleven. So you had nine eleven, and then of course Bush. And Cheney, of course, the PNAC document before that, um, and then Bush and Cheney, they institute uh, this uh, uh, Department of Homeland Security, right? Okay, so um, fine. All right. I mean, th those are the facts. I, I, we're not, not fine. It's fine, but those are the facts. But 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 but, how did we get? And, and was this planned? Because I, I look back at this, and the only way this makes sense to me is uh, through hindsight. I look back at this as the home, Department of Homeland Security was set up to really be uh, what it is today, and not against a foreign enemy, but to, 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 um, uh, to, to imprison, if you will, uh, the American citizens. And I don't, care if you're, I don't care if you're brown or black or blue or green or white, I don't care what color you are, if you're an American citizen, uh, that's what it was set up for. And I cannot for the life of me, and, and this is one of the investigative issues I'm having, or an issue of investigation I'm having, I cannot for the life of me understand how in the world we have a guy in the White House that we don't know who his name, you know, we don't know his name, 
folks. You know that. We don't know who he is. He's got no bona fides. And don't tell me. Don't pee on my leg and tell me it's raining, okay? Just to, it, 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 do not do that to me. Don't insult me by telling me or anyone else, any other American, that he, he has submitted his papers. He has not done anything of the sort, which is why these lawsuits are still going on with Orly Tates. She's probably the only one out there left in the field that's doing anything like this, demanding uh, to know who this guy is. Was he ever seen at Columbia? Of course not. Well, what was he doing? Well, look, could, he, could this have all been a big, massive setup from the start? Because you can't tell me, well, you can't tell me, and, and maybe even correct me if I'm wrong, but wouldn't the outgoing president, if he had a sense of decency and a sense of patriotism, and if he, if he gave a damn about the United States of America, wouldn't he ring some alarm bells and say, wait a minute, well, hold on a minute. Hey, uh, you know, I, look, I might be outgoing president here, uh, you know, but you better check this guy out a little bit further. Uh, it, wouldn't that be the patriotic thing to do? Don't question my patriotism when I question it or when Joe questions it or when you question it. No, no, do not question our patriotism. This guy is a cutout for the Saudis. Who is he working for? I think we need those questions answered. Do we need? Do we do, really? Do we need? Look! Look at what! Look at what has happened over the last five years. Do we need more time? Do we need any more prima facie evidence that this guy is not working in the best interest of America? Do we need more time? Uh, time paved with lies. Look, the U.S. dollar is in crisis. The country is in peril. We are in peril. Every one of us is in peril. What are we going to do about it? What can we do about it? Maybe we should just demand an up-down impeachment vote right now. And you might say, well, then we get Biden. So what? He doesn't do his job. We do the same thing, up-down impeachment vote. Let's do it. Let's get him the heck out of the, out of the White House. And then you know what? Uh, let's, let's start fixing things. And by the way, Joe, I'm not too impressed with this. Uh, I wasn't too impressed with Adam Kokesh, but I'm less impressed with the treatment by uh, the feds against this guy. I didn't see what happened, and apparently there's video out there, but I heard that he was arrested, but not arrested, more like kidnapped. And I don't know what truth there is to that. I did not see the... Look, uh, the bottom line is this. All right, he he was arrested by by uh, by, by the uh, police in Philadelphia. All right, he was charged with uh, oh goodness, <clears throat> uh, he was arrested by police uh, during a pro marijuana legalization protest on Saturday. Now he's char- been charged with assaulting of a federal police officer. There's a video out there. Okay, that's okay. good. All right, that does not show him resisting it shows him with his arms up in the air so people are saying he was kidnapped by philadelphia police i don't think we have to use hyperbole really okay he was arrested was he kidnapped Uh, uh, really Uh, okay so we have video Uh, again i i i'm not impressed by the man himself uh to the extent that he, he there, there's just something I, I, the guy could be the greatest guy in the world. I don't know, but to, to call for an armed march on Washington D.C. that raises a lot of questions in my mind, folks. I don't know if it does with yours, but with with me, where you're, you know, first of all, he's he's actually advocating you to commit a felony. Uh, yeah. are, are we going to win this way? Are we going to win this way? I don't think we are. So if we're not going to win this way, is there a logical point? I think we have to ask ourselves, is it logical to act in this fashion if we know we're not going to win 
by doing this. But but the bottom line here, there, there's a U.S. District Court filing against Kokesh that he physically blocked and obstructed uh, a U.S. Ranger and uh, grabbed the Ranger by the arm to hold him back. The video does not appear to show any of this. He also is facing charges of impeding a federal officer and resisting arrest. Uh, he's not going to be out allowed out on bail until at least Thursday because he's re refusing to provide police with his home address and also refusing to divulge if he has any firearms at his residence. Do I doubt? Do I? Do I fault him for that? Absolutely not. No. It's a twisted situation. Let me just tell you that now. If you're supporting, and uh, but go ahead. A good article that sums this up that I found today, Obama and government at its worst. It's a truism that no president makes it through a second term without some scandal. President Obama is no exception. Here we are just four months into the second administration, or his second term, uh, and we've got one scandal, or not just one scandal, but two, thanks to the reporting over the last two weeks, uh, it was revealed that in the wake of the Benghazi attacks, White House talking points were heavily edited by the State Department. The edits removed the suggestion that the incident, which claimed the lives of four Americans, was a terrorist attack. Then later last week, we learned that the IRS has been targeting conservative groups since March of 2010. And this is what this article says, but they're leaving out even more important um, information here because the Benghazi attacks are not about scrubbing talking points after the fact when it happened. That's not the scandal. The whole Benghazi situation is a scandal. Um, and the IRS, it's not just about targeting conservatives. It is about the improper use of authority and the lack of accountability when people are caught with their can in the cookie jar. But this goes on to say the Obama administration has problems. The question is, how big are they? Is it too soon to tell? There are some aspects of the stories that suggest they are going to make more than medium-sized trouble for Obama. To start, the particulars may be complicated, but both stories are easily understood to people who aren't uh, politics and news junkies. Um, one, the State Department intentionally obscured the truth about the death of an American ambassador weeks before a presidential election. Two, All right, w w w stop right there. We are not going to get the truth. We cannot, we cannot work within this system to get the truth. I just had to throw that in there. You've got Holder in there. We've gone through this with the Clintons back in, during the Whitewater days and so on. Uh, we're not going to work within the system to get to the truth. Go ahead and continue. It goes on. Yeah, it goes on to say, basically... Um, the IR, number two being the IRS intentionally auditing groups that were opposed to the president. Those are the take-home headline versions of the stories that they're putting, uh, and they're pretty clear-cut. But second, there is still reporting to be done on both stories. We don't know how much is left unearth to be unearthed, and I don't think we'll ever get to the real bottom of it. But regardless, it says, now maybe in a month, Benghazi and IRS enemy list will be put to bed. Maybe Obama will be celebrating a gang of eight past immigration law. Maybe the puzzle of Obamacare's implementation will start to look like, or will start to look a little clearer. None of this is out of the realm of possibility, but it's not hard to see how the opposite might come to pass. Maybe the month will be asking the same questions and holding hearings about Benghazi and the IRS. Because of this, opposition to immigration reform hardens as the bill dies. Obamacare continues to look like a mess. Legislators dig for the 2014. And vulnerable Democrats try to figure out how far away from health care reform they need to be in order to save their seats. See, health care, health care, or this Affordable Health Care Act is going to ruin this country. It's going mm -hmm. to, okay. The financial do we have time. But see, Joe, do we have the time to hold hearings? Our country is is in peril right now. Do we have the time to, 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 to the amass only hearings a special prosecutor? In we hearings. should be having our impeachment hearings. In criminal proceedings at this point. They should take Obama and Valerie Jarrett out of the White House in handcuffs, in my view. Obama for dereliction of duty and, for, and Valerie Jarrett for uh, seditious and treasonous activity. Folks, I, I'm not saying that lightly. 
I'm so, I'm, so, I'm I mean that they should somebody in the military, somebody with the power, somebody with the with the responsibility. Our Congress should step up. And yeah, you're right. Impeachment proceedings now. Let, let's let's just let's just go for it right now. Because which which scandal, by the way, do you want to pick? Do you want to pick Fast and Furious? You want, how about the IRS? How about Benghazi? These aren't scandals. These aren't, folks, these aren't scandals. They're crimes. Crimes. They're with high lives. Crimes. With lives. With, with bodies at the end. With people's uh, financial stability, maybe their livelihood at risk in cases of the IRS scandal. But the Benghazi scandal, you're talking about U.S. soldiers. And you cannot, yeah, you're talking about the lives of U.S. soldiers. And, and let me just explain, ladies and gentlemen, how serious this is. Okay, with, with, with respect to Benghazi, think of it this way. I'm going to give you a couple of examples. Think of it this way. You've got, uh, you've got a situation where you need to call in the big guys. So the big guys go in there and against a country or whatever, or against a, 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 a despot or whatever, and uh, they can't handle it. So they call in James Bond. Bond. James Bond. Well, he gets in trouble. Who does James Bond call? Did you ever think about that? Well, James, the people, who do the SEALs call? Who do the who do the army rangers call? Who do the special forces call when they get in trouble? You, you just brought up a great point. Where are the seals in their outrage against Obama in this scandal? Where is the military's anger and outrage? Well, I can tell you scandal? where where about thirty of them. Uh, thirty of them are lined up in coffins in, in well in the ground now, but thirty of them are, are wearing coffins. Uh, you know, SEAL Team Six. That's where some of them are. Oh, yeah. Let's toss that in there, too. Okay, SEAL Team 6. Because that stinks to high heaven. But, but, but okay, so, so who did, when, when people, for example, when uh, the ambassador and, and the others were in trouble in Benghazi, who do they call? I'll tell you who they call. They call the Global Response Staff. The global response staff is probably, I don't, I don't know, not too many people on the entire planet that make up the global response staff. I don't know, maybe a hundred if that at any given moment, maybe 60 or 70. That's how elite of a team these people are. The global response staff can arrive at a scene or be called and... I believe Glenn Doherty was GRS or uh, Ty Woods. I'm not sure which one offhand right now. I don't have my notes in front of me, but regardless, they have the same command essentially as a four-star general. They can commandeer aircraft. They can commandeer. It's it's picture this uh, in your town. You've got a police force. If uh, if a if a police officer gets on the radio and says, "Officer down, need assistance." Do you think for one moment that there there's not cars coming from every section of that town racing toward that location where that officer is down? Well, that's what GRS does. Do you and, and do you think for one moment and, and now think about this, you're the dispatcher. Who can stop? Who can stop that? Or or if that analogy doesn't trip your trigger, Think of this. You're the captain on an aircraft carrying 300 people, and, and all of a sudden your engines go out or you've got some sort of catastrophic problem on board the aircraft. And, and, you, and you call in, you say, Mayday, Mayday to the tower. And the tower says, you know, Oscar 235, you know, it, it verifies the fact that, that you have trouble, that you have serious trouble. Well, what does that FAA guy do or woman do? Make sure that 
the assets, uh, if, if that plane is going to land at a certain airport, make sure the assets are dispatched to be at the ready. Even if, even if it's possible that that aircraft might not land at that airport. I mean, they, they ready the troops wherever they are. That's what GRS does. And in order to stop GRS, you have got to issue a formal declaration. It's a formalized procedure to stop them from going to assist. Folks, understand this. It is not just, hey, uh, it, 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 everything's under control. Just step, you know, stand down. No, 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 no. There is a very formal procedure that they that, that they must follow, that the chain of command must follow. So an order had to be given. The stand down, when you hear about the stand down orders, it had to be given at the level of the National Security Council chairman, man in charge, woman in charge, whatever, or higher. Do you know how many people that is? Not too many. No. So we've got this, this, uh, this guy being interviewed by Chris Wallace who refuses to answer a question where the commander in chief was, you know, it, you, you think it's not important. You damn well better believe it's important where he is, where he was and what he was doing. Because I think folks, that is the issue that they don't want you to know what he was doing. You don't hand off the command in a situation like this to the underlings. You don't do this. You, you are present in the situation room or you are present. What, what, it, you are there to make, to make decisions right now. The situation is unfolding right now. We need an answer right now. And that's what, what, what you get a busy signal. You get a, uh, what? Don't bother me. I'm, I'm, I'm with, I'm with, uh, um, I'm not going to go there. Okay. All right. We're going to move along to some other news here. <clears throat> this something came out last Friday. We did not get a chance to hit on the media shield law and how this is not going to protect journalists and their sources. We, t we, we touched on the subject on the story, but we didn't play this um, audio clip. And why is this important? Well, Dad, you know full well uh, anonymity of sources and the importance of keeping a source secret many times. They have what a we don't hear to about. Disappear. Yeah. The, you know, the, uh, they die. Yeah. And or, or, I, or get marginalized or, or all of a sudden, you know. Commit suicide by shooting themselves yeah. four times in the head. But, but hey, you know what? Look, look, look. I, I got to tell you this. For every, you know, for those people who demand the uh, uh, name sources, look, we understand because you've got a blog and, and because, you know, you're, 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 uh, you've got this need to know just to verify that it's true, that I'm not hearing voices in my head. Yeah, okay, not a problem. Uh, we'll, we'll turn over the names of our sources. In fact, we'll even give you their home address and phone number. Would you like that? Would that make any difference for you? Oh, my word. You're right. Here's a clip. Uh, Media Shield Law fails to protect journalists. Under the Justice Department scandal, there is renewed interest in protecting the media's First Amendment rights. Now we see media organizations pushing for what's called shield laws, to protect reporters, and it looks like the Obama administration is on board. Here's President Obama talking about the law yesterday in the Rose Garden. So, uh, you know, the whole goal of uh, this media shield law that was worked on and largely endorsed by folks like the Washington Post editorial page and by prosecutors was finding a way to strike that balance appropriately. 
Uh, and to the extent that this case, uh, which we still don't know all the details of, to the extent that this case has prompted renewed interest about how do we strike that balance properly. Let me add him for a minute. Think, well, let uh, me ask some questions. Uh, now's the time for us to go ahead and revisit that legislation. Now, the New York Times has reported that Senator Charles Schumer has confirmed his plan to reintroduce shield law legislation. The senator said, quote, this kind of law would balance national security needs against the public's right to the free flow of information. At minimum, our bill would have ensured a fairer, more deliberate process in this case. He is, of course, talking about the case of the Justice Department secretly seizing phone records of reporters from the Associated Press. Senator Schumer first introduced the shield law back in 2009. Here's what it would have done. It's similar to media protection laws that already exist in several states. The federal shield law would protect journalists from having to reveal their sources. Now, if the feds want this information, they would have to prove to a judge that the information they want outweighs the need for journalists' rights, rights to keep that information secret. But it's important to point out that even this shield law allows exceptions when it comes to national security issues. That's why it's unclear if such a law would have helped out the Associated Press at all, especially since we've heard from the administration that the leak to the AP was a very serious one. Uh, when uh, we express concern about leaks at a time when I've still got 60,000 plus troops in Afghanistan uh, and I've still got uh, a whole bunch of intelligence officers around the world who are in risky situations uh, in outposts uh, that uh, in some cases are as dangerous as the outpost in Benghazi. Uh, oh, that oh you've got, to make you've sure got the that, nerve. Uh, you've got the, what they the do. nerve to talk about Benghazi. And the shield law did not go anywhere back in 2009. This was around the time of WikiLeaks, one of the largest leaks of classified information in history that prompted lawmakers to get tough on those that share government secrets. So tough that under the Obama administration, more whistleblowers have been prosecuted than any other administration combined. Some critics believe the administration targeting whistleblowers is intended to have a chilling effect on the media. I've been saying for years that the war on whistleblowers is really a backdoor way of going after journalists. Journalists appear in every single one of these espionage indictments, um, yet they've not been quite concerned enough that the government is willing to burn their sources. Well, as of now, lawmakers are split when it comes to enacting media shield laws. So we'll be keeping a close eye on what happens here what forward in protecting the freedom of the press. In Washington, Liz Wall, RT. There is just see what's happening here today. I'm sorry to cut you off. I'm just on a roll. But don't you see what's happening here? Look, they're going after your Second Amendment rights because... They're, they want to take away your First Amendment rights. They're going after these whistleblowers because they don't want the truth. They don't want you to know the truth. It's not that hard. If you look at, if you take a few steps back and look at the methodical way that this regime, I wouldn't even call it an, an administration, are we not seeing a methodical uh, uh, takedown of our Second Amendment rights, of our First Amendment rights? Are we not seeing methodical takedown of uh, of this this uh, not wiretapping, but grabbing the phone records? And by the way, it's not just the phone records in the a in the cloakroom, and it's not just AP. Do you understand how big this is? This is going after journalists, Congress people, and their aides. In every, now listen to me carefully, in every way, shape, and form in which they communicate. Now, you've, that's very important for you to understand. It's not just about phone records. You could take that to 
wherever you want to take it mentally. But it's very. Be, I want to be very clear. It's not just about phone records, and it's not limited to one room or one segment or one issue. It is widespread, and you will never hear the extent of what went on under Eric the Red Holder. Never. Sorry. Nothing to apologize for, as uh, you were right on the money. Something overlooked in the IRS scandal. The IRS has illegally seized medical records of 10 million Americans, a lawsuit claims. IRS is already under fire for targeting of conservative organizations and monitoring of Americans' online activities is now being accused of stealing the medical records of over 10 million Americans. A class action lawsuit filed in California in March claims that the course of serving a warrant for tax records related to a single former employee of a Southern California business, IRS agents stole more than 60 million medical records of more than 10 million Americans. The agents did this in spite of the fact that such a seizure was not authorized by the warrant, was irrelevant to their investigation, and it violated federal law, the suit says. According to the lawsuit, on March 11, 2011, the IRS conducted a raid on the corporation or corporate headquarters of the California company. The plaintiffs allege that the raid was unnecessary because the agency admitted the company was not under investigation. A confession backed up by both internal IRS records and the search warrant. The search warrant authorized the seizure of financial records related principally to a former employee of the company. It did not authorize any seizure of health care or medical records of any persons, least of all third party parties completely unrelated to the matter. This is just premature. See, the IRS will be um, will be in charge of handling the enforcement arm of the Affordable Health Care Act. And that's where this takes us. In addition to the lawsuits, the agents were aware that the company kept medical records for numerous Americans and that they would lose. And, to, and those records were subject to the privacy protection of the 1996 Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, known as HIPAA. During execution of the warrant, defendants saw that the company was a HIPAA-secured facility and were specifically told by the company officials that the records they were searching and seizing were private medical records of other Americans. Despite all this, the complaint alleges the agent told the company's IT personnel to transfer several servers of medical records and patient records to the IRS for search and seizure. Otherwise, they would rip the servers out of the building completely. No, that doesn't happen at low level. Usually, at low level uh, junctures of or low level people at IRS. Okay, just Correct. just so you under, just so you understand that. So, you've got something more brewing here, and, and uh, there's every reason to be very concerned about what the IRS is doing because once again, the enforcement division of the Affordable Health Care Act names the IRS as the agency in which. Um, that will be um, uh, enforcing this, and you're, the IRS can ruin your business, your family life. It could take everything you have, um, can throw you in jail. Look at Irwin Schiff, and you see the hearings, the the the, the court hearings, and what have you. They're not done. They are not done in a regular federal court room. These are administrative hearings. It's like a workers' comp hearing by administrative law judges. Understand the difference, okay? These are not federal judges in, in, in the normal in the normal cases that that make decisions that that can affect your lives. No, no. These are administrative law judges in an administrative hearing setting outside of the federal um, court system. So you've got no federal rights whatsoever. You're at the mercy of the IRS. They're at the whim of the IRS. And like I said, now with Erwin Schiff, a little different. Uh, of course, that federal judge uh, 
sentence him to life in prison, essentially, for uh, violating the tax code. It was a technicality, actually, if you, if you really want to get into his situation, and I think everyone should. He is a political prisoner in the United States. You want to see what the fate of many Americans will be? Look at Erwin Schiff. Study his situation. And I'm not talking about uh, Wikipedia or or the bozos out there now go to go to a library go to the, 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 the go get your hands on the real documents the court documents the transcripts go to the the source you will find out that the law is meaningless as a matter of fact i had a a, a source sent to me uh, you know, where an obama official and i sent it to you joe it's a video i believe where uh what what the heck was it? Uh, uh, the law doesn't matter. Basically, the law does not matter. We've we've seen this. This is uh, White House senior advisor. The law is irrelevant. Really. So okay. So the bigger picture is this, ladies and gentlemen. And please think about this as in in a bigger in bigger terms. Are, are do we have a king, or do we have a president? Are we subjects or citizens? What are you? What am I? What are we? Well, we're certainly being treated as subjects and not citizens. And this has been gone. This has gone on for a long time. And, and, and but I'll tell you, right now we're in the end game stages. Like I said, we are in peril. We don't have that much time, folks. We do not have that much time. We don't have time. You elect a special uh, prosecutor, for example, and uh, it, it pretty soon we'll be at the midterms, and you'll have the progressives saying, oh, yeah, oh, oh. Hey, you know, you're, you're making, it's, this is all politics because we're about the midterms. We don't have time for a special prosecutor. We need to go right for the throat of this out of control government that is that is ruining this country and we need to do it now we need to demand accountability of the people who represent us and we need to say look you go right for impeachment just pick one issue what the IRS Benghazi let's go with Benghazi the people died there they were murdered there left to die Got the der- dereliction of duty by the commander in chief. You've got his. Uh, oh yeah. B- by the way, that's Leavenworth. That's where he belongs. Is Leavenworth doing hard time? Not on you know not in uh, uh, helping his cousin uh, in uh, Odinga over there in Kenya, uh, or you know on his own uh, Isle, Isle of Elba. Okay. No, he needs to go to Leavenworth if proven uh, guilty of, of dereliction of duty as commander-in-chief, and he needs to do hard time. And if, uh, if that makes me a racist, I, look, I, you know what? I don't, I, I, don't even, I, I don't even care what color he is. It's his actions. He left people to die. Again, we need to think bigger than we have before. We don't have time. These are crimes. These are not scandals. They're crimes. Let's not refer to them as scandals anymore. We we cannot work within the system that we've got. Absolutely. You're right. They're not scandals. They are crimes. And they need to be treated as such. And people need to be held accountable for committing those crimes. Folks, we're up against the top of the hour break. It has been a terrific first hour even though we're covering a lot of terrible news continue I just, to pray for those in the midwest yes. as there has been a devastating tornado people are uh, calling it one of the worst ever 200 mile an hour plus winds a mile and a half wide tearing down going ripping right over an elementary school as it was in session wow. they're wow. still pulling kids out of rubble oh wow pray for the families Pray for the communities and those affected. And when we come back, we'll be joined by Frosty Woolridge. Woolridge, yes, thank yeah, you. Yeah, we're going to be talking about uh, we're going to be talking about the immigration. Uh, before we break, I just want to say this, uh, folks: if you are in the Raleigh, North Carolina area, uh, June seventh, eighth, ninth, come see us in 
Gold Star Mother Susan Price at the Apex at the Church in Apex uh, Baptist Church in Apex, uh, uh, North Carolina. We have the information on our website. Um, yep. And also, and I'm not sure when this is, and I'm not sure, but I was invited. Governor to, New York. Yeah, I was invited to to speak. We were invited to speak at uh, Governor New York uh, at a Tea Party. Uh, uh, meeting sometime. I, we haven't confirmed it. That just came in. I'm going to accept that. And uh, the, the governor of New York's somewhere, it's, it's around Watertown area. It's upstate New York. It's, it's not, not too far from Ottawa. Uh, so we hope to see you up there for the Tea Party members. I'm not sure the date. We'll let you know on that. And one more thing. I want to um, offer my condolences to a friend of the show, mm. a uh, a long time listener, I think, as long as we've been around, I can remember uh, being in the chat room. A friend of many in there, yeah, uh, who passed away from cancer, a uh, sh- short battle with cancer, and uh, our prayers go out to to his family. But we know he's resting now and is no longer in pain, and uh, he's with his with need to the be. Lord. That's wow. And, and those of you who contacted him and remained in contact with him know his strength and his outlook on things, and um, he wasn't sad. He was uh, happy that um, he was going to be reunited with his family, with his wife. So, you know, God bless him. We know the Lord will look out for him. And um, this is why it's so important. We we need each other because life is about so much more than, than what we see. That what's really valuable has no price tag. Folks, you're listening to the Hagman and Hagman Report. We'll be right back after these short messages with our guest. Hi folks, Doug Hagman here. You might know me as the co-host from the Hagman and Hagman Report or as a frequent guest on Coast to Coast AM with George Norrie. If you're like me, you're tired and confused over today's headlines. You just don't know where to turn for accurate, concise information about really what's going on, what's truly going on in today's society. If you don't know where to turn for accurate, well-researched, and properly vetted news, I've got a suggestion. In fact, it's a requirement. Bookmark Canada Free Press. That's canadafreepress.com on the Internet. It's just not for Canada. It's for news across the world. Judy McLeod, founding editor, has put together a vast array of talented writers like Kelly O'Connell, Daniel Greenfield, Dr. Eilina johnson Powell, a lot of guest columnists, very talented writers. Folks, that's Canada Free Press at CanadaFreePress.com. Now mobile-friendly, follow on Facebook, because without America, there is no free world. If you love pineapple as much as I do, I've got some great news for you. You're going to love this offer from Freeze Dry Guy. For the month of May, Freeze Dry Guy is offering the finest quality freeze dried pineapple, a case of six number 10 cans yielding 114 servings at a special introductory price. First quality freeze dried pineapple grown and packed with nothing added. This healthy treat works wonders with salad. It's great for snacking, hiking, hunting, camping, and for adding to your food storage program. And please note that Freeze Dry Guy's foods will store on your shelf for decades. Order now and get free shipping to your front door within the lower 48 states. This special introductory price is good until May 31st. For more information on the free to date product list, go to freezedryguy.com or phone 866-404-3663. FreezeDryGuy.com, 866-404-3663. You better wake up fast and listen to this, America. The Obama campaign has launched attack squads disguised as truth teams dedicated to intimidating and silencing all political dissent carried over the Internet that criticizes the Marxist Obama. Truth Squad specifically focused on covering up Obama's endless trail of lies, corruption, and subversion, and using the Gestapo power of our own government to police and censor the Internet and shut down websites that dare to carry the real truth about Obama's Marxist coup. Remember the names of these Gestapo-style agencies at work right there in your neighborhood. 
KeepingHisWord.com, KeepingGOPHonest.com, and AttackWatch.com. KGB, SS, and Gestapo-style police state gangster organizations at work to silence the important voices of patriot dissent, some of which have already been shut down by Obama's orders. Adolf Hitler would have been proud. We're the 21st century Tea Party Patriots. You want answers? I think I'm entitled. You want answers? I want the truth. You can't handle the truth. Hey, welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. You're listening to the Hagman and Hagman Report is heard live every weekday from 8 to 11 p.m. Eastern Time. I want to welcome new listeners this hour in the Pacific Northwest, in the Southwest, also in the, in the uh, Heartland as well, where they're experiencing some severe weather. I um, want to say welcome to you folks this hour. And also, uh, want to just tell you a little bit about. Uh, our guest this hour, his name is, and perhaps you might know him from his many appearances, his name is Frosty Woolridge. His website, frostywoolridge.com. That's frostywoolridge.com. He's writes, uh, just, I think, every day, five days a week at least, for the website before it's news. You can read his articles under immigration and he's got a, a, a book uh, and speaking program out, uh, How to Live a Life of Adventure. But one thing that uh, really caught my attention, and, and, and look, folks, we are, we are being inundated right now with both legal and illegal immigration. And one of the, uh, I had mentioned this to Joe, uh, when we were working in New York City, you could uh, blindfold uh, one of us take us to drop us off. We'll say in Queens, New York, uh, a, a block in Queens, and uh, take the blindfold off, and you would not know which country you were in. It could be Korea, it could be China, it could be God knows where. It could be Mexico. You just you wouldn't know. Well, look, since 1965, we had a piece of legislation that was crammed down our throats collective throats in 1965 we never asked for this piece of legislation not one time did we ask for it you see lyndon johnson along with uh senator teddy chappaquiddick kennedy drove america he not only drove his uh, his car but he drove america into it really uh uh, this this massive unrestrictive immigration that opened up the floodgates with the Immigration Reform Act. And i got to tell you right now, we've got, uh, in the United States right now, over 70 million immigrants, uh, people pouring at, at, at 2.5 million annually, both legal and illegal. We've got upwards of 20 million people in this country illegally. And we've got a gang of eight, apparently, that are going to decide their fate and grant them amnesty. You want to know what's being done to this country through illegal immigration and legal immigration, taking away our national identity, our national sovereignty, ripping the very fabric of our country. This is the man to tell you. His name is Frosty Woolridge, and with that, Mr. Woolridge, uh, welcome to the program. Well, thank you very much. It's really a, a pleasure to be with you, and I hope that we have a lively discussion this evening. And that discussion really... Uh, it supports exactly what you were speaking about uh, in the last few minutes, and I hope that we take it further because this issue is the single greatest issue facing America and all Americans in the 21st century. And the and the and the more we speak about it, and the more we address the the facts and the figures that we can that we are facing, the sooner we can take action uh, to stop it and to create a viable civilization, not only in the next 10 years, but the next 90 years, and hopefully survive the 21st century. So I'm really honored to be on your program. Well, it's an honor to have you, and I know Joe uh, uh, feels the same way. You've got a lot of information. 
I, I guess my first question off to you is, is uh, uh, was this planned? I, I mean, was the destruction from within by, by um, the balkanization, this is what I call it, I call it the balkanization of America, um, was this planned back in 1965? Is, is this some sort of uh, grand plan, grand scheme uh, that, 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 you know, to, to water down our, our culture, our religious and uh, cult, uh, moral culture that, that were that in this country? I mean, what's going on here? Walk us well, through I remember this. As, a, as, as a college uh, a person back in 1965, uh, and I had studied a great deal, and I'd tra- I had traveled uh, uh, around uh, a great deal of the world at that point in time myself. Um, and when uh, Teddy Kennedy, whom I now um, call the father of the destruction of the United States of America, uh, both Kennedy and Metzenbaum opened the floodgates with the 1965 Immigration Reform Act, uh, changed our annual immigration uh, of really mostly Europeans into this country to about 175,000 per year uh, to uh, an immediate 1 to 1.2 million per year. And in the last 45 or 6 years, uh, 43 years since that time, uh, we, we now have uh, an added 100 million more people to the United States. And if this new amnesty, Senate Bill 744, passes, we will have another 100 million more immigrants inside of the next 30 to 35 years, and we'll actually uh, top out with our own population momentum at 138 million by 2050. That's only 37 years from now. And, of course, that will jump another 100 million and another 100 million, 100 million after that. So we are really at a crossroads, and we are at a juncture. Whether or not Teddy Kennedy was trying to inundate the country uh, and with a grand plan to completely destabilize us and multiculturalize us, I'm not exactly sure. Uh, at the time, uh, it seemed like, uh, well, the rest of the world's suffering, and there's a lot of people that need an opportunity, and so we'll open up the floodgates and, and give that many people uh, the American dream. And unfortunately, as you and I know and as the American people have learned, it only gave us gridlock traffic and water shortages and energy crisis and polluted air uh, and, and, of course, all the consequences of fracturing our entire civilization with this, uh, this mythic multiculturalism. And so now we're in the middle of it, and if we don't stop it, then we are going to become the victims of it. I was, uh, Charles, I was reading... A You're article. muted, uh, Joe, I think. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, sorry about uh, that, Frosty. Frosty, I was uh, yeah. reading a uh, previous article you wrote, and uh, I, li- I liked your answer to this, and it seems it makes a lot of sense. How do you kill a country? Yes, well, thank you. That question, of course, uh, was answered by my book 10 years ago titled Immigration's Unarmed Invasion, uh, Deadly Consequences. And that book was was actually based on a speech made by uh, former uh, Colorado Governor Richard uh, D. Lamb, whom I've known for over 25, 30 years now because I live in Colorado. And he spoke in Washington, D.C. And when he gave that speech, he followed uh, Victor Davis Hanson, who had just uh, written Mexifornia, showing how California was being destroyed by the massive uh, immigration coming into the country. And one of the things that I wrote in in this uh, latest piece was, how do you kill a country? And, of course, how you kill a country is very easy. You kill its language, for starters, and that was the point number one of, of, of Lamb's speech, and it was the first chapter of my book. And, of course, if you know the great philosopher Immanuel Kant, he said the two great dividers are language and religion and uh, those and, and anyone uh, can see and understand across the globe uh, the great religions have separated people and and caused tremendous conflict and also uh, we see of course language is the next thing uh, and right now we're in the middle of having our entire english language our us constitution was written in english our bill of rights uh, in english and everything this country has stood for has been solved in a, with the English language for all of these last 237 years. Uh, but now the 
21st century immigrant coming into this country has a cell phone stuck to their ear and a a satellite dish uh, stuck back into their own country, and they're enclaving so fast that uh, we are losing the English language. We're losing the cohesion that it created as far as a language and a people, and we're losing the sense of being an American because we're now all hyphenated Americans, and these new hyphenated Americans simply are not full-fledged, fully in Inculcated uh, American citizens. They are they are some kind of a different brand. Uh, you can see that in the marathon, uh, Boston Marathon bombings just last uh, month, uh, with uh, the two boys that had been here since the age of nine and sixteen. Uh, they became uh, IED bombers. Uh, you, you saw the same thing with the Fort Dix Six. You saw that with uh, Major Hassan. Uh, with the Fort Hood killings, uh, and of course you're going to. There was the, the the Denver bomber who was creating all sorts of bombing materials uh, here uh, in Denver, and there are also I think in the same period here over 21 different uh, thwarted plots uh, to do great uh, damage to America, uh, and so we have a different kind of immigrant and. When you lose that cohesion of, of one language, and you're going to have consequences. And let me just state those, and I'm quoting right here. The fact remains that America cannot withstand, nor will it survive, two or more major languages competing for dominance. When languages compete, so do cultures compete. When cultures compete, a country cannot withstand the tension, conflict of misunderstanding, friction of different natures, anxiety of being misunderstood, the dread of trying to make oneself clear, and the apprehension of differing worldviews. What happens ultimately? A country's language dies, its identity dies, and then its future dies. One look at Norway and Sweden and France and United Kingdom and Belgium and Denmark and Holland should make that reality abundantly clear. And just a few years ago, as you know from my bio, I have bicycled all over the planet, almost 100 countries on six continents, from the Arctic to Antarctica, and I've seen this firsthand. Uh, as I came down from Nord Cap, Norway, I got to see that country fracturing under its uh, immigrant load, uh, virtually all of it coming from the Middle East, and they have horrific troubles in Norway, Sweden, and France right now, and I got to see them firsthand. So language the key to our success as a civilization is being undermined and will continue to undermine. And just think, if we do allow another 100 million immigrants into this country, they simply will not uh, become a part of America. They will be enclaved in America, again, with one ear to the cell phone and the other eye to the satellite dish back in their own country. Uh, and that will be uh, continue to f just literally fracture the United States of America. Wow. And, 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 you know, look, um, what, what, uh, and I know this seems like a small thing. I don't want to press one for English. I, I don't want to have my instruction manual for my whatever um, desk or gas grill or whatever you might get in five different languages. I, I mean, I don't know if that, if that sounds petty to you. Um, I, 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 and the other thing too, when I call for computer support help, and, and I know this is a, a kind of a different issue, but I certainly would like to talk with someone that I can understand. Um, it just seems like, it just seems like we are just, uh, they're I, coming I, this country I, from a constitutional republic in the United States to a to just a globalist uh, nation, it is. We are a globalist under a globalist agenda. They're implementing this globalist agenda in America harder now because we are the last beacon of freedom, as people say. So they have to bring it down. But, but, well, they, they yeah. certainly are. Whomever is in that that particular power position right now, and and let me uh, uh, quote this by uh, James Walsh. He's the former associate general counsel of the United States Immigration and Naturalization Service. In 1991, 
he made this statement, and that's now ICE, of course, and he said, and I'm quoting, immigrants devoted to their own cultures and religions are not influenced by the secularly secular politically correct facade that dominates academia, news media, entertainment, education, religious, and political thinking today, he said. They claim the right not to assimilate, and the day is coming when the question will be how can the United States regulate the defiantly unassimilated cultures, religions, and mores of foreign lands. Such immigrants say their traditions trump the U.S. legal system, balkanization of the United States has begun, unquote. That was from uh, James Walsh in 1991. Wow. Uh, it takes your breath away, that, doesn't it? it, it yeah, yeah it, it does. So what are we looking at here today? I mean, we're looking at, really, uh, well, let me ask you, because you're, you're the pro at this. How many illegal uh, illegal aliens here? I want to be specific in my language. Illegal aliens, lawbreakers, do we have in this country right now? There are three different numbers out there, and you can check the sources at thesocialcontract.com. And the first one is the 12 million number, which has been given by the U.S. government for well over the last 10 years. Uh, My research shows, and so many other research journalists show, that the number is most generally figured at around 20 million, and you can go to thesocialcontract.com to get that, uh, some of the the, the work and the research on that uh, verified, and some of the other figures are as high as 24 and possibly 28 million. Uh, those numbers, of course, are fluid. And we, but no matter what, the, the Heritage Foundation just came out with a figure that at the low end of a, an amnesty such as the Senate Bill 744, uh, you're going to have an immediate 33 million people added to this country uh, instantly who will be able to tap into our uh, social security systems, our medical systems, our school systems, our scholarship systems, and they will simply uh, start to break uh, those systems because of the sheer numbers. But that's in just one decade. And that you can go to numbersusa.org to verify that. And beyond that, uh, immigrants have an average of 900,000 children per year, 900,000. So, it's possible that within the decade uh, we'll have somewhere close to 42 to 43 million people added to the country in one single decade if this thing passes. And then let me really put a damper on your spirits this evening. Uh, our own population momentum, uh, even though women have, have averaged about uh, two children, 2.03 children uh, since 1970, uh, we have not brought this population escalation upon ourselves But because uh, even at two children per woman, uh, we have a population momentum of one million added per year. So you're looking at somewhere between 42, 43, and even as possibly high as 50 million uh, people added to this country in literally a decade and not much more than that. But for sure, we're going to add 100 million immigrants to this country from all kinds of cultures, all kinds of religions, all kinds of languages that will make what I call a polyglot of chaos uh, America. Instead of the American way of life, will become the American polyglot chaos uh, of life. And it's not going to be pretty for anybody. And, and as a matter of fact, we're also going to experience what Samuel Huntington, uh, the author of Clash of Civilizations, wrote. And this is a short quote. Let me quote this. It is my hypotho- hypothesis that the fundamental source of conflict in this new world will not be primarily ideological or primarily economic. The great divisions among humankind and the dominating source of conflict will be cultural. Nation states will remain the most powerful actors in world affairs. 
but the principal conflicts of global politics will occur between nations and groups of different civilization. civilizations. The clash of civilizations will dominate global politics. The fault lines between civilizations will be the battle lines of the future, unquote. And what that means is, is we're ingesting this kind of conflict into our own country because having multiculturalism in a country like ours is like having a, a three-sided coin. You simply can't have it. You can only have one culture, and then that culture thrives, and, and, and you can have another culture on the other side of the coin, but that's another country. That's another place. Uh, if we try to create three-sided coins, we can't do that. Uh, and if we try to create uh, co-equal or tri-equal uh, cultures in our own country, or we try to bring uh, co-equal to, say, 20 or 30 or 40 different cultures, it can't be done. And inevitably, as Samuel Huntington said in his class of civilizations, you will have cultural conflict, and all ethnic groups, all cultures compete for dominance and so you're going to see some tremendous fracturing of this country if this thing passes and this country continues to accept these millions upon millions of immigrants. Well, and I personally believe this regime that we have in power, actually the whole lot of them, the 535 and the executive branch, mm -hmm. everyone, okay, they... The, the majority of these people, in my view, want to see this country fundamentally changed. And by that, I mean destroyed. They want to rip the fabric, the moral, the cultural fabric of this country. They're ripping our heart out and our soul out. And it, 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 it however you want to describe it. But, but let, let me ask you this. Uh, You've got this uh, gang of eight right now, and, and maybe I'm going a little bit off script and out of order, but you've, you've got this gang of eight that's supposedly going to hammer through this immigration uh, uh, agreement, bill, whatever. The bottom line here, we're, you're going to see this massive amnesty shoved down the throat of every American citizen, like it or not. It's a bipartisan deal. Would you agree with that? Well, I certainly would. Now, I, I want to give everyone an appreciation that there is a great deal of hope here. Back in 2007, uh, and I have been a member of NumbersUSA.org now for well over 12 years, I've worked with Roy Beck, and he should be on your show because he's brilliant in his uh, addressing what we're facing, and he will echo much of what I'm talking about tonight, but also Jill Weidman and Gretchen Pafe uh, at uh, CapsWeb.org, that's C-A-P-S-W-E-B.org, we only had 700,000 members back then, and if you remember, George Bush said, I'll see you at the signing table for the Comprehensive Immigration uh, Reform Act bill. And, of course, we flooded Washington, D.C. with not just thousands, but millions of faxes and phone calls from the members of these two organizations, and we beat back that uh, the terrible bill. Well, this is a this bill in 2013 is exactly the same kind of bill, and even worse uh, because it gives even more amnesty to more people, which will create more of an invasion on upon our country. And they jumped the legal immigration from a million minimum every year to 1.5 million per year. So the onslaught will even be uh, with greater uh, intensity. And so at this time, however, we have 1.4 to 1.5 million members at numbersusa.org and capsweb.org. And you better believe these are people who care about the country and the future of this nation because they've got kids. And from just a sheer environmental uh, uh, addressing of what we face environmentally, whether it's acid rain, uh, it destroyed fisheries, uh, gridlock traffic, uh, polluted skies over our cities, lowered quality of life, and of course, the more people there are and the more immigrants in our country, the wages will necessarily uh, diminish, and so that we'll all be living less than a middle class life. And so the key here is is that everyone listening tonight becomes members of these two organizations so that you too can collectively have the power to defeat 
these this bill, this Senate Bill 744, and make these Congress critters actually enforce the immigration laws on the books, because the fact is, they have not been enforcing these laws since 1986. There's no provision whatsoever in this new Senate Bill 744 to enforce uh, the immigration labor laws, uh, the immigration transportation laws, and certainly uh, housing laws. Uh, there are so many Americans breaking and violating our laws uh, that uh, it's become, uh, again, just an invasion. Uh, and it, our, these two organizations have the ability to force them to finally come to terms with the fact that the American people will not tolerate this anymore. I'm at Caps Web. Dot org, and I do see what you're talking about here. Um, by the way, folks, that is C A P, like Paul S W E B dot org. It's actually Californians for population or population stabilization. Californians uh, uh, population stabilization. So it's C A P S uh, web dot org. Anyway, what got, although you offer us a glimmer of hope and, and you do, mm -hmm. I, I am through the roof when I see McCain, what in the hell is he thinking when he's just insisting on increasing mass immigration and amnesty amnesty? What about Jeff Flake? He wants to bring in millions uh, more immigrant workers to take our jobs from us. Help me here. At the same time, all the jobs are being shipped out of this country. Right. Well, give, it's a, it's a, please make me smile. Please give me some... <laughs> I, 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 <laughs> okay, I, I'm, I'm looking for my blood pressure meds. I, I can't find well, what, it. Okay. What you're, what you're seeing is a triple threat here. Uh, Charles Schumer from New York was also, and he is on this uh, gang of eight, uh, and so is John McCain. John McCain was there with Charles Schumer in 1986, and John McCain, for all those years since, has failed to represent the American people, and he has done a very poor job representing uh, Arizona. And Flake is the same way. Uh, these two men, uh, well, the ga whole gang of eight, uh, Michael Bennett uh, from Colorado, uh, unbelievably out of touch with reality, none of these people, and you, you take a man as old uh, as John McCain, he has no concepts of environmental degradation, he has no concepts, the guy's worth, you know, 20, 30 million people, his wife owns a giant brewery, uh, the man is not does not and cannot understand what's happening to the average American family that that right now 47 million Americans subsist on food stamps. I want you to get that number. You can look it up. Again, just Google it. 47 million Americans obviously don't have a job, can't secure a job, and can't eat because of it, so they're living on or subsisting on food stamps. And that number is going to grow because if this new massive onslaught of population of 33 million legalized immigrants in total in the next decade at a minimum uh, hits the market, you're going to see the jobs literally all go into the toilet faster than a bullet train. And men like John McCain and Charles Schumer, Orrin Hatch of Utah, Boxer and Feinstein from California, Carl Levin from Michigan, all of these culprits are actually representing illegal alien migrants that have come to our country illegally, knowingly, hop the borders, are here in violation of our laws, are using our medical facilities for free, are using our school systems for free, are sending back, no question, the average sending back of cash transfers to Mexico every year is $24 billion dollars. Total in the world, it's close to $80 billion uh, going back from immigrants, not only legally but illegally in this country, uh, almost $80 billion per year going to South America, into the Caribbean, into Mexico, and then into Asia and over into Europe. That's $80 billion drained out of the country, and about half of it is uh, paid money under the table. Uh, it's the second largest underground economy in the world here in the United States because our own presidents, the last five of them, our own congresses, 
uh, last how many Congresses we've had in that amount of time, will not and have not uh, enforced the laws that are on the books. And you can bet they will not enforce any further laws in the books. And so who gets to win? Essentially, we're creating a plutocracy in this country or a corporatocracy, if you want to call that, because the corporations who forever want cheaper and cheaper labor don't care about the American worker and they will continue to import all of this cheap labor, and they get rich and drive their Lear jets around, and you and I get to drive our Yugo. <laughs> exactly. I, I got to tell you, That's Frosty. Exactly. I, I, I just I, I want to just tell you this real quick. This is funny, Joe and I. Well, we're investigators by profession, okay, uh, or were. Um, uh, but uh, this happened. Oh, I don't know, five years ago, maybe. During the fall, we pulled up into this apple orchard, huge orchard. I mean, there must have been, I don't know how many people picking apples, but my goodness, <laughs> you couldn't, I mean, you just, it was unbelievable. It was a big operation. So we pulled up, and uh, we, we were there to get a statement, of, uh, a recorded statement from someone. had nothing to do with the workers. It, it had to do with the... Uh, one of the one of the people inside the administration, and uh, so someone had when we pulled up. I, I guess we pulled up into the wrong area because it was like where this uh, gathering of these workers were, like a uh, outbuilding, picnic shelter, lunch area. I don't know what it was, but um, we no sooner than got out of the our vehicle, and I had uh, I had shown my badge identification to someone that had was approaching us just merely to ask where this individual was i don't think we've ever seen so many people run and, and i mean run from us into the fields in my i've never seen that happen in my life and all these people were here illegally i mean that that that, that was what was told to us i mean it was one of the most incredible things i've ever seen in my life i guess my question to you is what in the world are these people like these orchard owners what are they thinking is it just about money that's it for the most part that's correct you have to appreciate this uh, i've traveled to many many third world countries uh, and the poverty and, and the illiteracy uh, go hand in hand uh, and the, the, more, the more poverty in the country, the more illiteracy, and the more illiteracy, the more poverty, and the more babies. Uh, the world right now has about 7.1 billion human beings. About 2 billion of them live on less than $2 a day and literally starving to death. 18 million human beings starve to death every year around the planet because they simply don't have enough food to eat. Uh, and yet the planet and humanity adds 80 million net gain. That's 80 million new human beings, new babies every year. They are coming in so fast in these third world countries because of culture and religion and illiteracy that they are starving, they are desperate, they are uh, literally at the end of their rope. Uh, right now, Mexico, a, a failed country, but not one of the worst countries in the world by any means. It has the 11th largest GNP in the world, I think. It's close to that. It's one of our largest trading partners, and yet it's so corrupt that it's, it's rich stay on the top of the pile, and the poor are forced into the kind of poverty that they have. But it's also cultural poverty. It's, it's the illiteracy that's married to it. And so, as you can imagine, when you add this 80 million net gain to the world, uh, a degree or a percentage of them are going to try to immigrate. You're going to see more and more refugees throughout the world immigrate into uh, the, the Western world. Australia is a one big hot spot for a destination. Certainly uh, Europe is another destination. Canada is another destination. And, of course, America, the United States of America, is the main destination because of all the freebies that this country gives uh, to people, food stamps, uh, free medical, uh, the, the schooling, uh, assisted housing, uh, the anchor babies that are coming into this country, around 350,000 jackpot anchor babies every year. Uh, there are actually websites to help 
those in poverty-stricken countries come here to just to drop a child so it can have a U.S. citizenship, which will then anchor them. And then, of course, the chain migration that goes beyond that will bring in uh, you know, entire uh, communities into this country. So they are coming here to save themselves from the misery of living in these third world countries, and they'll just do just about anything. As a matter of fact, Forbes magazine uh, did a report, and I actually quoted the report, $7 billion a year for the Pacific Rim, uh, refugees and illegal immigrants and everybody else that can pay the money up to the tune of $7 billion a year uh, are coming here to this country. We have uh, we have millions of illegal Chinese in this country, uh, illegal Russians in this country, uh, certainly illegal uh, Africans in this country, Indians in this country, uh, and and so th- we're the golden goose. We're 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 the the country that uh, has the mythological you know a, 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 a pot of rainbow, uh, a, a, a gold at the end of that rainbow, and so yeah, they're going to keep coming because uh, again that the world can't feed. Uh, these people, and they're not going to stop reproducing. Uh, and so they're coming to America. So no matter what we do, no matter how many people we immigrate into this country, there will always be another 80 million added as we go toward uh, 10 billion by the end, uh, by the uh, by the next 37 years, by 2050. And so if we don't stop this flood of humanity and make them responsible in their own countries, then we will become victims of this massive uh, uh, immigration onslaught of our civilization. Um, Frosty, we see, as you said, the, the continuation of between anchor babies to people from all nations coming over here in droves. And I, I'm all, if there's a family in need of uh, asylum for some reason or persecutions from their countries, I'm all for helping people in need. And, and when it gets to the point where you're neglecting your own people in need to help people. Uh, elsewhere are who are in need it gets that's where i get kind of screwed up at but what will happen when we see i don't know we'll say six months even a year maybe when we have 11 million extra illegal immigrants most of which might be on some kind of federal assistance whether it be disability food stamps etc and they shut off the food stamps and they shut off the stores and there is a some kind of emp attack or a, a monetary collapse how much more chaos and turmoil, do, or if any, would that would it add to uh, what we would already go through? Well, that is outstanding to ask that question because most Americans don't think about it because this is America. But this is no longer the America that most people uh, used to know. It's a now a polyglotted, uh, multilingual uh, country where uh, the hyphenated Americans are not pulling in the same direction as the American Americans. In other words, those of us who are native-born here and have participated. You have to really understand that so much of the illiteracy that we're uh, creating in this country uh, comes from mass immigration. Now, let me give you some facts. The American Reading Foundation has found that 42 million Americans, 42 million Americans cannot read cannot write, and cannot perform simple math. Now, I'm a math and science teacher. Uh, I've I've worked in the ghetto. I've worked in the inner city, if you want to be euphemistic about it. And you can't even begin to imagine how many children come uh, to school from illiterate parents, and then they simply uh, facilitate the same kind of illiteracy because there's no... uh, there's no academic thrust and no academic propensity in their families and then in themselves because their cultures do not value uh, education. That's much. That's what's happened to Mexico. Mexico, the average kid doesn't get past sixth grade. They can barely read and write in their own Spanish language. So we now have 42 million people who are functionally illiterate. Mostly, they can only do jobs like work at the Marriott Hotel for you know five bucks an hour or whatever. The other frightening aspect of illiteracy is that another 50 million Amer- Americans can't read past the fourth grade level. So, ladies and gentlemen, that's about 92 million people who really can't function past even a fourth grader. So what does a fourth grader think about? Mostly me and now and recess, and that's about it. And this great governance, this great constitutional republic, it absolutely demands an educated populace so as we continue to add millions upon millions upon millions of culturally illiterate and, and intellectually illiterate persons to our country, 
there's no way for uh, there, there's no way for any kind of critical thinking uh, to vote those who are in office uh, that should be there. Uh, I mean, look at the fiasco of voting a John McCain into office for the last 36 years, or a Teddy Kennedy for 44 straight years. The man never did a, a day of work in his life. He never faced what he created. He was always in a gated community. And so what you're seeing, and I've found this in my world travels, those on top don't care how bad it is for those on the bottom as long as they're in their gated communities with their clean water and their power boats and their airplanes and so forth. Well, that's what's happening to America. The very, very rich are becoming very, very much more rich, and the rest of us uh, are the ones that are paying the freight and becoming poorer at the same time because we can't even hold uh, a, a decent job at a decent wage anymore because of this massive onslaught of, of I think it's 40% of African-American men right now don't have a job. And 68%, and you can quote me on this, 68% of African-American children today in the United States are brought up by single mothers. Single mothers. And so... That's why you're seeing so much unrest in the inner cities. So if the food stamps aren't given out or the, the, the assisted housing or all of this welfare isn't given out at some point, you are going to see tremendous conflict in the, in the cities in this country. So we've really put ourselves into a heck of a corner on this thing, and it is quite sobering as to what the outcome uh, will probably be, but I would say violence will be uh, the end result of all this. Uh, yeah, I, I have no doubt in my mind, if you look at this, once again, this regime, and, and look, you know, I, Frosty, we haven't talked before, okay? I, 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 I got to tell you, I, I, and folks listening to this, I've, I've come to this conclusion, that that uh, what's happening is is we're we're uh, the United States is basically becoming uh, globalized, balkanized, and then globalized. I, I believe there's a hidden hand here. It's the globalists, and and, the, and whether you want to call this frosty, forgive me for going out in the weeds here and on a limb, but you, whether you want to call this the Illuminati, the, the the people, you know, this sounds so conspiratorial. And I used to think that way. I mean, I used to think, nah, come on, you know. But I got to tell you, I mean, from what I'm seeing here, it's almost as if um, we are bowing to globalist paymasters. Now, maybe I didn't articulate that well, but that's what I see. But that said, let me get back on topic here, and let me ask you a question. If, if you were in charge right now, would you gather up all the illegals in this country and ship them back? I mean, because I would. I mean, well, I'll, I'll be I'll, well, I'll, I'll be flat out and tell you I would. Well, you, you actually, I, I, in my book, Immigration, Non-Arm Invasion, Deadly Consequences, in my latest book, America on the Brink, the next added 100 million Americans, I have, I, I have what I think is a very excellent solution. First of all, I'd cut all legal immigration down to, at the most, 100,000 per year. And the reason for that number uh, is 100,000 that could benefit this country that speak English, that could actually uh, be a part of and contribute to the society, uh, because another 100,000 egress the country every year. Uh, so that's what I put in my solutions part of both of my books. Secondly, the question you're asking, uh, do, you, do you deport all of them? You know, the simplest thing to do is start methodically in the state of Maine and in the state of Washington and in the state of Michigan, and then just go around to all the businesses that are uh, employing people in those states and then start checking on uh, forged uh, Social Security numbers, uh, forged any kind of uh, driver's licenses, forged any kind of documents, birth certificates, so forth, and, and, and check whether or not these people working in these factories, such as Hormel up there in Minnesota, uh, certainly a Tyson Chicken out in Arkansas, uh, certainly uh, the Montford people, the, all of the, 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 the illegal alien employers of Marriott Hotels, uh, go after them and start putting the CEOs of those companies in shackles and march them out in front of the cameras, and I'll guarantee you, you arrest them, who, the ones who are employing illegal aliens, 
And then you, because there are about 8 to 10 million illegals that are now gainfully employed in the United States of America. 8 to 10 million. And that's on top of the fact that we have 14 million Americans who are looking for work and can't find a job. So you, you arrest them, you prosecute them, and you throw them in jail. I promise you this. Once we start enforcing the law, our immigration laws that are now on the books, and ICE starts doing this internally, you would see 12, 20, 24 million illegal alien migrants would be paying their own dime on the next bus, plane, or train, or their own car back to the border because they don't want to go to jail. And that is the easiest and simplest way uh, to get 8 million jobs and as high as 10 million jobs for American citizens at a living wage because the jobs would have to start paying a living wage and those those capitalists that are doing all this lying and cheating and thieving and they know who they are, they would simply be in jail pretty quickly. You would see a whole bunch of uh, these CEOs uh, coming to terms with the law, they would have to start paying out FICA. They'd have to start paying out taxes. They'd have to start paying out uh, state taxes, local taxes, and they'd have to hire American citizens at a living wage. It would be a win-win for everybody. And at some point, uh, countries like Mexico are going to have to start dealing with their own population overload. As a matter of fact, Mexico right now doubled in the last century from 50 to 104 million people. It's now at 114 million. It's expected to grow to somewhere around 140 to 145 million uh, by the mid-century. So there's no end of the line of all these poor, desperate Mexicans who want to come to America, or Salvadorians, or uh, Colombians, or you know Ecuadorians. It doesn't make any difference. Again, the numbers keep adding. So that to me, would be the simplest way to solve the illegal immigration problem without having to have mass deportation. Just go after the uh, the illegal uh, uh, people who are hiring illegal aliens, and you would solve it very quickly. Interesting. Now, I, I see on your website, and that's uh, mm-hmm. folks listening, fr- uh, frostywoolridge.com. You've got right. books like America on the Brink, which was written, I think, what, 10 years ago? Or no, uh, back in 2008. Um, yep. You've got, uh, uh, what other books? Let's see, America on the Brink. And then you've got Immigration on our, Immigration's Unarmed Invasion, Invasion. Uh, written Correct. in 2004. Um, the, the information in these books, still relevant today, would urge uh, people to get these these books for some good background information. Um, do you do you have any other books I missed that? Uh, yeah, I, well, I think I've you got mentioned an, I've one. Got, yeah, uh, well, there, there there's many other books that are out there. Uh, one of them, uh, of course, I've got another ten books. I, I see. I'm an adventure writer. I've l- traveled around the world. You'll see lots of ad- my my latest book is. Uh, uh, how to Live a Life of Adventure, The Art of Exploring the World. I have a website, how to, how to expl- I mean, it's just uh, how to uh, live a life of adventure.com. Uh, but my serious website is the frosty Uh Because what, what I try to do in all my columns is educate uh, and then motivate uh, the American people to save themselves. Uh, there are other books out there. Uh, Richard Heinberg wrote the book Peak Everything. Facing a Century of Declines. Chris Clugston wrote a, a brilliant book called Scarcity, uh, uh, Amer- uh, 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 Humanity's Final um, final Hour. It, it has to do with resource exhaustion. Uh, you've got other books out there that uh, talk about how, uh, how are we going to sustain ourselves. Seven states right now are in water shortages in this country. Seven states. How are we going to fee- have water for another 100 uh, million immigrants that are about to uh, uh, enter this country in the next 30 years if this Senate Bill 744 passes. So there are quite a few other books. In fact, let me just, I'll jump over here and I'll get you them. He literally jumped over there to get them. The information uh, is out there. Here's one by Edward C. Hartman, The Population Fix. Breaking America's Addiction to Population Growth. Another one is called Plan B uh, 4.0 by Lester Brown, Mobilizing to Save Our Civilization. There's another one here uh, by uh, uh, a man I know, Dave Foreman. It's called Man Swarm and the Killing of Wildlife. 
our population is growing so fast in this country that we're killing off, creating the extinction of 250 creatures every year here in the lower 48 states, uh, a total of 2,500 creatures every 10 years because of our massive population loading that's encroaching on the habitats. And this other uh, book here is by a friend of mine, uh, The Long Emergency, uh, by James Howard Kunstler, and he talks about surviving uh, the end of the age of oil, the climate destabilization, and other converging catastrophes of the 21st century. The fact is, we are facing some ominous, I mean ominous, uh, and daunting challenges. And the one way we can survive them is by stopping mass immigration into this country and by making sure that we do not allow mass amnesty. We found out in 1986 that it does not work. It simply does not work. It encourages more of the world's desperate people. But in the, in the final analysis, if you get a man like uh, Roy Beck on, he has two, at NumbersUSA.org, he has two brilliant videos. One is called Immigration, Poverty, and Gumballs. It's a five-minute uh, appreciation for how hopeless and futile it is to continue immigrating all these people from around the world to make our country literally resemble and mirror their country, desperate, overpopulated, uh, with, uh, with the lack of, of resources and water to feed and water house and, and, and sustain all these people. And then he has a second one titled Immigration Off the Charts. It's a 10-minute video, and you can just see it. It's very plain. It just uses all of these uh, gumballs. And once you see that, if, if the entire Congress of the United States saw these two videos, the five-minute one and the 10-minute one, they would vote to shut down the borders tomorrow because in the end, all of our children, no matter if we're black, white, brown, red, yellow, no matter where we came from, are all going to suffer as this next 100 million and then 137 million uh, people uh, began inhabiting the United States of America, it's simply unsustainable. Man, wow. It, it, these numbers are staggering. I mean, really. It, and they roll off your lips like... Yeah. And Frosty, we only have a few minutes left before break. What is the new book you're coming out with? Or you have come are out you, with or something yeah. about fathers? Uh, did I get this right? Uh, well, I, I, I actually I have several. I have, one of my latest books coming out uh, it has nothing to do with immigration, but my latest book that just came out last year is uh, How to Live a Life of Adventure, The Art of Exploring the World. And in that book, I show anyone and everyone at any stage of their lives how they can go out and live a very fulfilling life uh, and how to fund it and whether they want to stand on the, 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 the South Pole like I did or they want to stand on the top of Everest, uh, uh, then they can do that. Uh, but that's that's another. What I'd like to do is give you just a couple of quotes that I think are very important here. The Nobel laureate Dr. Henry W. Kendall said, and I quote: "If we don't halt population growth with justice and compassion, it will be done for us by nature, brutally and without pity, and will leave a ravaged world." And this is another one by a Dr. Albert Bartlett at albartlett.org. Uh, I've worked with him for over 30 years. He said, and I quote. Unlimited population growth cannot be sustained. You cannot sustain growth in the rates of consumption of resources. No species can overrun the carrying capacity of a finite landmass. This law cannot be repealed and is not negotiable. And finally, Dr. Otis Graham of Unguarded Gates, he is at Stanford. He said, and I quote, most Western elites continue urging the wealthy West not to stem the migrant tide that adds 80 million net gain annually to the planet, but to absorb our global brothers and sisters until their horrid ordeal has been endured and shared by all of us, 10 billion humans packed onto an ecologically devastated planet, unquote. Those quotes ought to sober every person listening across America tonight because that's what we're facing. We're in a collision course with our own numbers, and we can we can do something about it now, but at some point, we will not be able to save ourselves. We will be just like the passengers on the Titanic. We will be lucky to survive if we can get to a lifeboat, or we are simply going to go down with the ship. No matter if we were first class, or second class, or third class, or we were throwing coal into the boilers, 
this population monster is going to take effect on everybody here in the United States of America, no matter what their name, what their rank, what their class, what they do as a job. It's all going to come down on our ears everywhere in this country. Sobering indeed. Folks, we're talking to Frosty Woolridge. His website, frostywoolridge.com. We'll have something up on our website linking to your website. Certainly uh, your books. Uh, I'm not a big bicycler. I'll tell you, bicycle? Why did you take a car? I mean, wouldn't that be easier? <laughs> Uh, uh, never mind. Uh, but, but certainly, <laughs> folks, uh, uh, seriously, uh, folks, the, the books that he has, very interesting, the numbers, um, the the overpopulation or the population, the immigration aspect of the books, uh, now that's up my alley. Certainly, I would urge everyone to uh, grab a copy of, of your books there and uh, uh, visit your website and, of course, the links from your website as well. And I yep. want to thank you so much for, for your sharing your time tonight. Because this is, I mean, this is ground zero right now. I mean, as I said at the opening of our program, look, we're out of time. Our country is in peril. And this is a big part of it. This is a huge part of it. So you've really lost. It surely is. And to, to leave you with the positive, again, org and numbersusa.org. Pass those two uh, five-minute and, and ten-minute videos around to all your networks. We can and we must save ourselves, and we can only do it by our actions. A constitutional republic uh, absolutely demands the citizens take action. If you sit back and watch, then pretty soon your kids are going to curse you for being uh, completely apathetic and having done nothing, and you will leave them with a world that is not going to be to their liking. So uh, uh, thank you very much for having me on board. Uh, look forward. We can do, I, my we'll, latest we'll series is a series on overpopulation. We can do it again. Oh, absolutely. We'll have you back, my friend. Uh, what a wealth of information. I want to say thank you so much for joining us on short notice. God bless you. And, uh, folks, again, Mr. Frosty Woolridge. That's frostywoolridge.com. And look in his books book. Yeah, books section. Frosty, thanks. God bless. Have a great night. Appreciate it. Thank you, Doug, and thank you, Joe. It's a pleasure. Thank you, right. Frosty. Thank you. Well, and that was uh, Frosty Woolridge. Uh, my, my head, first my, time we we talked to the gentleman, and uh, people in a few people in the chat room were talking about the population control thing, and we went through this before the show. The, this is not eugenics at all. The guy's no, no. basically no. stating that at the current rate that. Uh, and the way that the governments control the resources, the way that everything is controlled, they're setting us up for a mass die-off, basically. The guy doesn't push eugenics at all. He just brings the facts of overpopulation when resources are controlled at the level they are. Uh, and, and you know something? Okay, you could have uh, someone with multiple messages. But if that person is an expert and knows the numbers and knows, and, and if you have this, and, and we do this too as investigators, um, you don't have to like every aspect about a person or a source or a witness or whatever. But if you have this, this narrow uh, avenue of questioning and of questions, and, and this person is an expert in that area, it would be we would be remiss not to provide that information to you. So those numbers that he gave are staggering numbers, man. Holy cow! What are we doing to this country? And of course, the good news, of course, he, he gave us as well, is we can stem the tide, or at least with the knowledge imparted, we can we we can at least share the information and stem the tide. Folks, you're listening to the Hagman and Hagman Report up against the last hour. Coming up is the last hour of the show where we take your phone calls. The number is 661-244-9839. We're looking forward to your calls and news on the other side. Stay with us.
Hi folks, Doug Hagman here. You might know me as the co-host from the Hagman and Hagman Report or as a frequent guest on Coast to Coast AM with George Norrie. If you're like me, you're tired and confused over today's headlines. You just don't know where to turn for accurate, concise information about really what's going on, what's truly going on in today's society. If you don't know where to turn for accurate, well-researched and properly vetted news, I've got a suggestion. In fact, it's a requirement. Bookmark Canada Free Press. That's canadafreepress.com on the Internet. It's just not for Canada. It's for news across the world. Judy McLeod, founding editor, has put together a vast array of talented writers like Kelly O'Connell, Daniel Greenfield, Dr. Eileen johnson Powell, a lot of guest columnists, very talented writers. Folks, that's Canada Free Press at CanadaFreePress.com. Now mobile-friendly, follow on Facebook, because without America, there is no free world. You better wake up fast and listen to this, America. The Obama campaign has launched attack squads disguised as truth teams dedicated to intimidating and silencing all political dissent carried over the Internet that criticizes the Marxist Obama. Truth squads specifically focused on covering up Obama's endless trail of lies, corruption, and subversion, and using the Gestapo power of our own government to police and censor the Internet and shut down websites that dare to carry the real truth about Obama's Marxist coup. Remember the names of these Gestapo-style agencies at work right there in your neighborhood. KeepingHisWord.com, KeepingGOPHonest.com, and AttackWatch.com. KGB, SS, and Gestapo-style police state gangster organizations at work to silence the important voices of patriot dissent, some of which have already been shut down by Obama's orders. Adolf Hitler would have been proud. We're the 21st century Tea Party patriots. In America, the familiar face of your trusted local pharmacist is rapidly becoming extinct. The personal treatment from small community drugstores is finding itself bulldozed by the giant chains. At its heart are the pharmaceutical majors and insurance firms who have teamed up to stifle the competition, as an Assistant Turkin reports. Pharmaceuticals in the U.S. a major money maker. Huge drugstore chains are popping up on every street corner with multiple locations and endless services. Dwayne Reed, Rite Aid, whichever, the big ones. Um, not that I prefer them, but it's just that they're the only option. We're from New Jersey, so we go to CVS. <laughs> when in New York, Dwayne Reed, but mostly CVS. Competition for mom and pop shops is steeper than ever. In places like the Big Apple, where rent alone is sky high, small neighborhood pharmacies are all but extinct, with the city overflowing with giant chains like this one. The town drugstore, symbolically, was always at the center of American culture and American life. And now, as the big chains move in, not only do the prices tend to go up, but they squeeze the little guys out. Hi, this is the pharmacist. However, small pharmacies have more issues than just the increase of big box shops. Health insurance companies have been merging with drugstores, taking away Americans' choice of where they can get their medicine. If they fill at my location, they would have to pay 50% of the cost of the medication. If they filled at CVS, they would only pay 30% of the cost of the medication. Sarah Frado has had her shop in a small community in upstate New York for about six months. Offering personal attention and a more intimate approach, she's built a good reputation with the locals fast. I'll do it right now. But the pharmacist says an increasing number of her patients have been learning they have no choice but to do business elsewhere at a giant pharmacy across the street. What they do is, and we just had one this week, um, a woman came in, she wanted to fill her prescriptions at our pharmacy, she was sick of CVS, um, the long waits, the lines, the rude, you know, employees. And we you know, took her prescriptions, took her insurance card, billed it to her insurance, found out she could not fill anywhere besides CVS. Majid Hosian runs a pharmacy in New Jersey and is faced with the same obstacle. He says he has lost a fifth of his patients because of these deals the big stores are able to make. You want answers? I think I'm entitled. You want answers? I want the truth! You can't handle the truth! Welcome 
Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to hour number three of the Hagman and Hagman Report this Monday, May 20th, 2013. We had on a guest in the second hour, Mr. Frosty Woolrich. Woolrich? Woolridge. Woolridge. Uh, I struggle with his name, and I shouldn't um, because I've seen it so many times. I just want to uh, plug this in here. Um, if you think about this, you know, I mentioned the balkanization of America. What I probably should have said is if you look at what happened after the Second World War in particular, how Great Britain had carved up the nations you know, in a manner that, uh, well, through Great Britain, um, it, it was a uh, joint effort, uh, United Nations, Great Britain, whatever. But the nations were carved, the the, the uh, uh, kind of the lines of the countries in Europe and, and even in the Middle East didn't make any sense. It crossed through the the uh, pop, the uh, country lines, crossed through cultural uh, split, cultural segments and this is why we have the problems that we have right now because when you when you do this you make the population controllable controllable by an external or from an external location i mean think about what happened the the way the countries were were uh lined up or or cut up and carved up after world war ii and is is this not what we're seeing here, um, not the carving up necessarily, but by infiltrating, by by, by causing these, uh, by retrofitting that same concept that we saw in World War II in, in Europe and and, and uh, the Middle East, is this not what we're doing here in this country? And, and, and again, retrofitting. Because the United States, as I was told, and, and folks, you can believe this, is a speed bump to the globalist plans of unification of the single global governance. And what, by doing this, they're going to knock down that speed bump, wear that speed bump down, and uh, pretty soon we're just going to get sucked right into this, this single global governance system and um, controlled from... A distant location, and I keep pointing to Great Britain as as where to look, specifically London. But that's just my research, and some people that have uh, given me information. So, Joe, I just uh, kind of took that away from you. Oh, and I just want to mention too, for those just joining us, uh, we had a good for great first hour, and of course, Frosty will will reach the second hour. I want to just remind everyone on Wednesday, uh, Steve Quayle, Pastor Langford, nine o'clock Eastern. Uh, it's going to it's actually going to be a very spiritual program, communion program. It's it's uh, spiritual communion. I think we need that, yeah, because time is so short. So pass that along to everyone that you know, and. Uh, also, I'd like to remind people once again about the National Insecurity Seminar, June 7th, 8th, 9th. Susan Price, Gold Star Mother, keynote speaker. Joe and I are going to be there supporting Ms. Price and giving uh, some of our own thoughts as well. Register early, please. Uh, the attendance is very limited. I'd like to match the name with the face. With the, uh, It'll be fun. I mean, it'll be fun to meet those who can attend. It'll be informative as well. We, that we promise. And Susan, if you're listening, we'll, we will uh, definitely, uh, I got your email and uh, not a problem. <laughs> How's that? Yeah. And uh, we're going to be going to the phone lines, but just want to give a quick update on news about the weather and the tornado. Uh, headline, front headline of Dredge really pretty much sums it up. Tornadoes ripped through Oklahoma. Destruction. Mile-wide funnel. 200-mile-an-hour winds. 51 deaths as of now. That number could be small compared to the number that they come out with tomorrow. As uh, people are still be pulling from, pulled, being pulled from the rubble, both dead and alive. And rubble from schools to businesses to homes. All over 
as uh, CNN calls this an apocalyptic vision to watch the aftermath of remnants of twisted cars and parking lots that look like junkyards, destroyed homes on fire. And it says, uh, our worst fears are becoming realized this afternoon. Bill Bustling with the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration Storm Prediction Center told CNN as um, many uh, people were killed, as I said, but it demolished pretty much an elementary school that was in session, and that's very sad. And our prayers go out to everybody and anybody who are affected by weather events like this, and this one in particular. With that, we're going to go to the phones. Area code 347 first. You're live on the Hagman and Hagman Report. Three four seven. Hello. You're up. Oh, good evening, gentlemen. How you doing? Very well. What's on your mind? Uh, I'm just uh thinking about the Benghazi situation with Obama, and a friend of mine. I was uh was discussing it the other day, and he seemed to be in denial about it, and. You know, I called you guys once before. I, I'm the guy losing friends over Obama. Uh, and a couple people came around, and uh, they started, you know, saying to me, well, you might be right about him. I said, well, I um, hope you don't know realize before it's too late. Because well, I agree with you, gentlemen. You know, somebody needs to start impeachment hearings, do something, before it's too late. <laughs> Exactly. We don't have, call our, our, the time is so short, we don't have enough time right now. We need to bypass the special prosecutor. We need to bypass all the, the pomp and circumstance and go right for the juggler of this regime, this out of control government. It's broken. Let's fix it. Let's go to the impeachment. Let's go right for an impeachment vote. And I'll tell you something. If this doesn't work, then let's try something else. But for the love of Pete, we have to get our country out of the tailspin that we're in. There you go, caller. I put you on mute because we could hear uh, the audio in the back. Okay, you still hear me? Yeah, we can, yes. Okay. Um. No, I'm just very concerned here because, uh, you know, I don't think we're going to make it through this year where things are going. Something Roger bad's going to happen. And, you know, I just think it's going to get out of control here pretty soon. You know, people are upset, okay? I work uh, for the city of New York, and 95% of the employees were born in this country. Okay. Okay, we're a minority in a public, uh, you know, which is the largest public hospital uh, system in the country, and it's 5% of Americans that work there. Yeah, so are, are you... It's, it's, out, it's outrageous. The other 95%, are they legal here or illegal? Uh, a lot of them... No, actually, I know one case where a young lady who's there got... Benefits part of a union, and she's from Belize, I believe, and she's not a citizen. Perfect, perfect. This is just well. And, of course, they're, they're, yeah. working, they're working. They're working in uh, a public hospital setting, and most of the employees there are foreign graduates, doctors from other countries, can't practice medicine here, but they're making eighty nine thousand dollars a year. And you got people out there. They got friends out there with degrees, master degrees in computer. Uh, no, I, I mentioned computer science. I got friends out there with master degrees in computer science can't find a job. I have well, a friend in North Carolina who who traveled from North Carolina to New York for a job interview. Wow. He Time goes out to North Carolina. He goes, he goes to a job interview. He's being interviewed by Pakistanis and Indians. They're not going to hire him. You know, that's a scary thought. I had to think about that for a moment. Let that sink in. Wow. Wow. Because you know, the, 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 most, most of my colleagues at work 
are from Uzbekistan, China, the Philippines, Dominican Republic, Haiti, Iran, Pakistan, India. Okay. And I'm, I was born and raised, I'm, I'm from South Carolina. Okay, I'm saying, I'm, I can't, you know, all my, in my department, I think there's only five of us. There's a problem of a thousand people. Wow. Do you, do you have, uh, one thing, because of your situation, let me ask you this. Do you have language and communication problems with the coworkers? Oh, especially that. Okay, culturally, too. You know, uh, a lot of, okay, I designed software for the regulatory department uh, for the hospital. And, you know, it's like an a internal audit. You know, they making sure things are done right. And they have to pull charts, and they have to review them, and they have to put their findings in there. And a lot of these folks can't even format a sentence. They don't have basic, basic typing skills. They use com computers every day. I got in trouble. I got lectured the other day about I'm too hard on these people because they don't know English. <laughs> okay. Well, uh... I'm complaining about it. I'm saying, listen, I said, what kind of results do you expect when people with no computer skills, no typing skills, can't format a sentence? What do you expect for it to come out? I'm saying, I mean, you know, I don't understand right. this. There's no okay? basic and I'm being, element I'm being of communication. Counseled. Yeah, and I'm, I'm insensitive, okay? <laughs> well, you need to learn all seven languages of all your coworkers, that, uh, their home languages. I mean, it is getting to a point that it is, I mean, I've been to a McDonald's in Buffalo and couldn't order food from there because they didn't speak English. And it's not just yeah, Buffalo, I mean, it's, it's all over the, the U.S. This is happening in major cities, big cities. Yeah, and uh, the patients that come through there, most of them are, well, up here in New York, there's an influx of a lot of Mexicans here the past year or so. And in the hospital, okay, uh, you know, they come there to get free health care, they get metro cars to travel the subway systems free, they don't pay a dime, you know, they don't speak English, they come in with six or seven kids. Okay? You know, mm -hmm. in my health care, you know, I have insurance. But I'm saying I've got to make co-payments. You know, my insurance don't cover everything. Okay? Even though I work for the city. Okay? They come here. They get everything. They even get much more cost of travel back and forth. Okay? For transportation. For a trans system in New York City. They, they give them away. Oh, man. It, it, it's upside down and backwards, caller. I gotta tell you, it, everything is backwards. So you can relate to what Frosty said. A any closing comments, my friend, before we cut you loose? Well, yes. Uh, yeah, I appreciate you guys uh, let me talk. Uh, no, I just uh, feel like um, you know something needs to be done. Okay, somebody's gonna have some balls in Washington D.C. and say, "Listen, enough is enough." Okay, it's enough already. So. Thanks, gentlemen, for listening to me, and uh, you keep up the good work, okay? Thank you for your call. Moving right along. Okay, thank you. All right. Uh, moving right along. We got a full bank of callers. Six six one two four four nine eight three nine is the number. We're going to move right along here to area code eight six five. Is that what you? No, oh, anywhere eight six five. You're up. Eight six five. Welcome to Hagman Hagman Report. Hey guys, um, just real quick, I want to start with this, and that is, please pray for everybody in Oklahoma. I mean, this is just a tragedy, absolutely horrible. And then also pray for Adam Kokesh. Uh, I wanted to read something that was kind of humorous. Um, it was pasted on my Facebook page, and it's a photograph of Adam Kokesh, and it simply says, New sport coat, $150. Gas to Philly, 200 Not dropping the microphone when being wrongfully arrested, priceless. <laughs> but picking okay. back on... <laughs> yeah, I thought that was good. Uh, picking back on what that gentleman was just saying about the hospital, I found this out tonight. A lady that I go to church with, uh, her appendix exploded. So she had to have emergency surgery tonight. So oh, we're all man. praying for her. But what was so interesting about the case 
is as soon as she gives, goes into recovery, they are letting her go from the hospital. There's not a day, there's not a layover. Whoa, 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 whoa. How does that work? Okay, uh, and I'm, being, I'm being serious. Uh, when you go from the uh, operating room to the recovery room to the lobby and then to a cab or what? I mean, seriously. Yep, seriously. That, that is seriously the way that it is. By the grace of God, she has family members that could go pick her up. You know, well, otherwise well, I would have been there. But no, that's well, your Obamacare. And it's can, not even being implemented yet. What's, can you, do you feel comfortable telling me what city this is? I mean, not that it makes this a difference. This is Knoxville, Tennessee. Knoxville. It's in Knoxville, so, Tennessee. Uh, yeah, I'd like to see the manual somewhere, uh, the hospital manual, where, where they say that this is uh, appropriate care. And folks, understand this, too, okay? Um, operating room, recovery room, lobby, you're out the door uh, from an emergency appendectomy? I, uh, okay. Yep, it came you, down the prayer train. Yep, it came down the prayer train. Yeah. I mean, you, it's, you, it's that serious. You know, the, the one thing I wish is that Hillary Clinton was dead. The, and the only reason I say that is because she would be turning around over in her grave because she's the one back in the 90s that made sure that women that gave birth got to stay two days in the hospital. Because if you remember, they used to be turning them out the same way after they gave birth. Right. Right. Uh, wow. Yeah, that, that's, a, yeah, I mean, yeah. But holy cow. Um, wow. Um, yeah, but you can verify that this is a hundred percent. I mean, you're talking hours yeah. after surgery. This is yeah, after recovery. Yeah, she's to be picked right. up by her husband and taken home. All right. Well, you know, this is something that we, I want to follow up on too, because I, I not that I don't believe you, but I want to know why. I want to know. If if this has anything to do with the Affordable Health Care Act, folks, and and if if you think the Affordable Health Care Act is going to benefit you, just visit the DMV, visit the post office, watch the post office do their job. Come on, are you serious? Um, and, and you know we've got uh, twenty thousand pages of Obamacare, and we don't know what's in it basically. So, anything else before you cut your loose caller? Well, I even attempted to read it. I got through about a thousand and fifteen pages, and I finally just threw my. I even got the the lost black dictionary, and I finally just threw up my hands when I was trying to put on a uh, protest in regards to it because I couldn't read it because they write the language that you can't understand. Well, it was probably yeah, it was probably in German or it's probably in Spanish or something you you got the wrong copy no I'm just kidding but you know, you're it's very true it's it's legalese and uh, um no oh, it's just crazy it's beyond crazy well, let me throw this one yeah let me throw this one idea out to you and the reason I, I captured this is because I saw what happened in Seattle Washington and that is when the guy got pissed off enough at his neighbors he took the bulldozers and ran over some houses and some cars. What if there we could have a diesel f- fuel fund for those that want to take their diesel equipment to Washington? And I don't even say go by the White House. I say find their homes and, and position their vehicles in front of their homes. I think that might get some attention. Interesting concept. I, I I don't know. I mean, it definitely an interesting concept. But, but most you know most people don't live in D.C. They 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 have a uh, temporary quarters there. But uh, yeah, I get your drift. It's an interesting concept. Yeah, I mean, if, if, yeah, I mean, if we, if we could all collectively donate for a diesel fund, because we have to get the equipment there, and these guys are not out of pocket. I think these guys will stand up and do exactly what I just said. They don't have to do anything wrong, but what they have to do is make a point. Well, we've got to do something, uh, caller. We, we, we really have to do something. And I want to thank you very much for your call. I want to say God bless you. Thanks for, thanks for this information. Thanks for listening from Knoxville, or that area, anyway. God bless you. Talk Hi, to you again. Thank you. God bless you. God bless Interesting. you. Interesting. 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 
Yeah, why not get why not get a semi or two or three and park it in front of uh, Nancy Pelosi's uh, D.C. residence or even her home uh, residence? You know, uh, send the message. We we we've got to start thinking out of the box. So that's very interesting. All Moving right. along, we're going to go to area code five seven five. Thanks for holding. You're up next. You're live on the Hagman and Hagman Report. Good evening. Well, good evening to you, I, too. I am. Well, you, yes, you, indeed. I wasn't sure I was the 575 you were referring to. Uh, yeah, uh, you are, uh, and uh, you're looking good, too, sir. Just well, kidding. Thank you very much. It's been, uh, it's been a long time getting this way. Uh, the, <laughs> the comment that I wanted to make is that I think you're falling into the same trap linguistically, that so many other people fall into. And I have been writing on, you know, my web uh, shots pages and all that kind of stuff. We are not having a problem with illegal immigrants. We're having a problem with criminal trespassers. Yeah. If you go where you don't belong, you are trespassing. If you commit the crime of crossing the border to get there, you are a criminal. Very, very well said. And I very think well if more people would call them what they really are. Now, I know I had a, a friend of ours back in the East Coast who worked in a hospital, and there were myriad women of Arab extraction coming to this country, eight and a half months pregnant, delivering a U.S. citizen, and going back home to raise a jihadi. How much sense does that make? Whose lame-brained idea was it to say, well, just because you're born in this country, you're automatically a citizen? That's how we wound up with a illegitimate pretender in the White House. Oh, well, if he was born in Hawaii, he must be a citizen. Well, he's not a natural-born citizen, not as understood by the people at the time. But, you, you know, make a good nobody point. pays attention. Words have meanings. Very much so. Getting back to what you said about Obama... Why do you think, and I'm, I'm, I'm going I'm to ask this, uh, I'm, this is a deliberate question here. Why do you think no one cares or seems to care that, that we don't have his bona fides, that we don't have his uh, actual papers, if you will? Uh, what's, what's, what's behind this? Looking at the bigger picture here. I think it is nothing more or less than the what's in it for me syndrome. I got my Obama phone. Well, SEIU, is, 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 uh, if I was in SEIU, well, he's backing me. Well, I'll back him. Now, I come from a union background. My father was in a construction union. I spent 38 years working in a, out of a construction union hall. And I keep trying to tell my brothers who are still working, if your country goes away, your union will go away. And your job will go away. It's just... Oh, well, yeah, but he's backing me. Uh, but, Romney's anti-union. Well, hey, you know. See, I know what you're saying. That, that, that might be a problem. I, look, I, I know what you're saying, where it's, I've got, I've got mine, you know, too bad for you type thing. Um, yes, absolutely. Hooray but, for me and heck with you. But, but... E if you combine, I, 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 I'm being very um, uh, deliberate here, and, 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 and to a fault, I suppose. I'm looking at this. I'm looking at Obama as as the perfect Manchurian candidate. Um, 
and, oh, and absolutely. yeah now but i'm also looking at this this reluctance this reticence to to uh, to to out him um and to immediately throw the race card into this uh, see, I, I I think this was masterfully done. And I don't mean that in, in a uh, complimentary way, of course. But no, the uh, evil genius behind. Like, like if you get in a bar fight, and the guy plants one on your chin. You stand up and you know, just like in the movies, where your jaw and say, "Boy, good shot." Well, that's what we got. We got exactly. cold talk with him. Yeah. Yeah, we did. And the people who are pulling his strings, uh, 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 are you familiar with a, a young lady from uh, Lone Tree, Colorado, by the name of Ann Barnhart? Oh, sure. We've had her on our show, and uh, we're in contact with her frequently. Okay. Yes. Yes, okay. If you read her column that was published the 10th, I believe it was, of this month, she says that there's a very distinct possibility that Obama was just is just as expendable as I forget uh, Chris Walker was it? What was the gentleman's name in Benghazi? They're, they're expendable. Stevens, uh, right, okay. right, yeah. Stevens, yeah, okay. Right. Uh, and he was put there, and when. It looked like their whole, and you can't make me believe that Obama dreamed up this gun running scheme. Who I'm did? I'm sorry, despite tingle up Chris Matthews' leg, he is not the genius he is purported to be. Right. So, uh, so but, he was but. stuck in there, in the hot seat, to run guns to the Syrian rebels this week. Right, right. Who knows where they're going to go next week? I mean, gun running is a good industry. I mean, it's a Washington-based industry. There's but, but, Holder. But, but, yeah, but, but don't you think, though, that he was... Um, you, you see, I don't believe in coincidences. And, and don't forget, uh, Obama's mother, Geithner's father, worked together in uh, the, the Ford Foundation in microfinance. Then you come to this time, and, and you see, uh, to, you, you see him. Um, if you go through his life, he was. How was the schooling paid for? Well, we know that he uh, was helped by the Saudis in his schooling. If you look close enough, and if you look at the facts, and he was recommended by uh, the Saudis as well. And now he's doing the bidding for the Saudis. So I, I'm looking at this kind of in a larger sense, where it's beyond that. You know, I got mine uh, too bad for you. Uh, however, that's part of the that's part of it. But the bigger part is the intentional placement of a of a cutout to take this country down. That's what I'm looking at, and uh, I think we're on the same page. I just I'm just trying to get a, a bigger picture angle here of this. I guess. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I like to say, I'm not some, I'm some kind of conspiracy theorist or anything, but if it squawks like a duck and it waddles like a duck, whatever else is happening, it ain't a flipping canary. No, you're, you're, well, Simple you're 100%. Right. It, no, it, you're... I mean, if, if, it's, if, if, it's, if, it's, if it stinks of conspiracy, you know, when you're in a Fulton fish market, it stinks of fish. You know, it's fish. You can't convince yourself. You know, you can't, can't, there's no sense in trying to convince yourself of anything different. Yeah, so, I mean, exactly. It is, is a deliberate, concerted effort to take the country down. And anybody who voted for Obama is, in my opinion, as a Vietnam veteran, and having been uh, literally, well, allegorically, slapped in the face by that election, by two elections now. But it is literally to take the country down. 
and 58,000 right. of my brothers in arms came home in body bags, except, of course, for a couple that never quite made it even this far. Oh, man. And this is, this is what we get as a, you know, a, a people. I, I was home probably 20, 25 years before somebody said, thank you for serving. And, I, and, and it, it makes me feel a lot better now that I have children who have served, uh, children-in-law who are serving now, uh, and grandchildren, well, grand, one grandson, serving now in uniform. And when I see people say thank you to those kids, it makes me feel really good. It makes me feel like there may be some hope for the country, except that it might be just a little too late. Yep. It wow. can be nothing. A deliberate, it's nothing but lies, and the father of lies is the father of all lies. That's right. And I think it's they're, they're, they're trying to foment civil disturbance because they think they can win. Why do you think the gun grab is going on? If, again, you've got the hooray for me and the heck with you attitude. Diane Feinstein brags about the fact that she got her, she got her concealed carry in California. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's outrageous. Break. You can't even the, get a gun in California. Yeah, they uh, are exempt from all rules that they expect us to follow and ex exempt from all taxes they expect us to pay. Exempt from all laws they oh, expect absolutely. us to follow, and, and you know, et cetera, et cetera. Caller, we're going to have to cut you loose and go to another call. God bless you, and thank you so much for your call and your insight. We really appreciate it. Okay, thank you very much, gentlemen. Appreciate the work you do, and blessed be. God bless you. Thank you for your service, my friend. Show great well. call. Great call. Yeah. You know, it, it's but, but I, he had me thinking there and going down that path of that larger scenario. That's why I was kind of mentally. I was wondering what you were doing over there. Was it sure if you're having a stroke or you were thinking or? Well, if you do think about this, <laughs> and if you think about how perfectly this was all set up right from the beginning. Well, yeah, and, and, and that's how coming to a head right now. Yeah, yeah, and, and and you know, it just it's it, again, ladies and gentlemen, the the deeper you get into the research of really what happened, uh, I cannot see how anyone, whether it be somebody from MSNBC or whatever, how they could possibly deny the collusion, the criminal collusion yeah. that's going on. So. All right. We're going to go to the to our six one eight caller in a second. I just want to say this, um, you know, we're talking about all these problems and all the things going on in the country and in the world today, but there is a solution in the Book of James, chapter one, verse six. Or I'm sorry, verse five. It says, "If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives to all." liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith, with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For let no man that is supposed to, or suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is double-minded, unstable in all his ways. Speaking of unstable in all his ways, um, that leads us to our foundation. We don't waver if we have a sure foundation. In Isaiah, it says, Whosoever believes will not act hastily. A person who, and then that's a quote from Isaiah. This is a quote from a book. The rest of this, a person who acts hastily is an unstable person because his actions were not properly founded. This person is easily moved and swayed by the storms of persecution and trials. And this, I'll leave with this last quote. What we learn in the presence of God cannot be learned in the presence of men. Amen. And that's all I have to say on that. And we're going to go to 618 now. 
thanks for your patience and being on hold. You're live on the Hagman and Hagman Report. Good evening, guys. How are you guys doing tonight? Fantastic. Very well. Oh, okay. Um, I just had a question. That I would just throw it off the last caller. It just happened to spark something. And I would just ask, uh, well, I'm sorry, Joe, you're, you're a little bit more younger than your father, so I'll ask, a, I'll ask your father this question. Um, would this have been possible, and let's just say a, a president like Obama, Dean, was that possible? What, 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 what time period was that not possible? And what time period did something change? What, I mean, just looking back in a little bit in history, just what time period was this not possible? And maybe you're not even, maybe you're not even old enough and everything, but it's just, I'm just wondering yeah, what, I, what changed. I, there, there had been something that physically, not, well, not physically, but spiritually, just something, something grabbed a hold of this country. And I'm just trying to pinpoint, you know, just, just for, uh, information no, purposes. Uh, that's a great question I, I and folks think about that question yourselves think about that question <laughs> but personally I, I look I love history I love to read books I mean uh, that's my favorite thing to do is to read um, now that said in, in, in reading about history um, I, I think there were a couple of times in history, one being the 1910-1917, okay, where we were the most we were very vulnerable with the passage of the Federal Reserve Act and the uh, um, inst implementation of the uh, uh, IRS. Uh, and the, the the monetary situation, and, and then of course when we had FDR in the the White House, and the New Deal and the programs that he initiated, and then of course with the um, later on in history with the uh, uh, creation of the of the United Nations. But I don't think to answer your question, I think it had to take nine eleven, the attacks on nine eleven of one, to create the infrastructure. Uh, the security infrastructure that would um, uh, uh, create the ability for our government to silence the uh, political dissent. And I think that that was the day that everything changed, in my view. Now, that's a rather simplistic view, but we could, we could take it apart further What's your answer, caller? Um, I and you know what? Well, I start asking myself just some questions. You know, um, we always refer to the, uh, you know, the people who fought in World War II, and we just kind of, you know, we hold that up very high, and we the morale was, and just uh, the morals of people were, you know, very high. And I, I just kind of look back at, let's say, that generation. But see, I, I'm at a disadvantage here. I'm I'm only 38, so I can only think back so far. I can only even look back. And I don't have that, just, you know, I don't know what it was like being around in the 50s or the 40s and, you know, before then. And so uh, I just I just wonder if, you know, the, the things, I mean, my, I'm just asking myself simple questions. In the 50s, if a, if a person with a even questionable background as the president would, or with, you know, with associated with different other people that would be uh, of uh, questionable uh, characters, um, they, I don't think they would have been allowed to be in office. They would have, they well, would have just said absolutely no. The, 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 you mentioned the 50s. The, the, that's an interesting period of time in history because we had uh, Joseph McCarthy, the Senator McCarthy. Uh, yeah. to, you know, the, the McCarthy, and McCarthy was 100%, absolutely 100% correct. And I will say that he did a lot for this country, but was marginalized. He was vilified, and he was destroyed by the political machinery in Washington and, I, and, I, and, and in Hollywood. I purposely just brought. That's why I said the fifties, just because he pops up into my head when I when I think back and just do a little bit of uh, research in terms of the fifties and what my dad. And uh, he's my dad, seventy six, so I can ask him a certain questions in, in that regard. But it just always grips me to where ask that, ask that question. 
you know, would it would it have been allowed in the '60s? Would it have been allowed in the '60s? There had been when I when I asked that question, and I think Joe would probably more um, have a little bit more of an answer that in terms of that there had to been something in terms of what you well even you said Doug that it's so perfect, and so that per that that perfectness. I don't think this happened by accident. Maybe that that's the spiritual. That's when something just grabbed the hold of this country and just 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 went as hard as it could. And I think that would that would that would probably be the answer to that. Uh, yeah, I I, I I I think you're right. And the, and the, the, the what what gets me and and once again, this is kind of some pretty heavy intellectual discussion. Yep. You're looking at a number of things that happened incrementally and uh, moments in history, but checkpoints in history. We have, for example, there had to be the centralization with the Federal Reserve in order to get to the point we are today with the dollar, um, with the creation of the Federal Reserve. There had to be the centralization of power with the IRS in order to get here today that we're, where we are with the affordable health care. And you can even go back to saying the establishment of a free nation like America would be the only way to bring that full circle the way it has. I mean, that you could be looking at agendas spanning from before America, looking at America, creating it as such to bring it down later in a way that would bring down the world. I mean, it could go that deep. So it's, so you can see the little bits and pieces in, throughout history that you can look at, but there was an absolute just to get to this point, I mean, to this point right now, and you just look around and you just kind of throw your hands up and you're like, what's going on here? There had to been, I, the incremental pieces were, were set, and the, the little pieces, it was set, but man, there had to been something else just in maybe what you referred to as maybe 9-11 was just the absolute catalyst, which just threw it, you know, in, in full drive right there after that. I just don't see that happening back in a, I don't know, I, don't, I just think people would question we, the background we, and, and those yeah, well, we came close with uh, in the '90s with the Clintons yipping about uh, right-wing talk radio. But uh, yeah, you know, all the pieces had to fall into place. I really think that we had to experience a sucker punch like we like we experienced on 9/11, and, and it, that sucker punch could have been, and, and I believe it to be, um, uh, with questions, with significant questions about. Uh, complicity by this, uh, by by uh, globalists in, in power here in America. Now that said, yeah, I I just think that the, what we're seeing is, is a dynamic but methodical evolution of events that brought us to where we are today. Can we walk it back? Is the question. Just just with that comment that you said, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Sorry about that. Just with no, that. Right. But see what 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 happened after I see the point of the nine eleven and I see that that being but see now we're even going to the point to where you know you hear reports of just uh, you know in terms of how the police are being trained by the you know the, and then what they're being uh, you, you see it now turning against outside forces now it's turning toward even American citizens itself and so right. that's that's that that is a very big huge jump right there. And it's that's it's a very scary jump. Well, and, and I'll and I'll put this out there as well. Um, we know that this regime, specifically this Obama regime, wants to kill the U- U.S. dollar. They've said that. They, I've reported on this. Could we have done this? Um, well, I don't know, 25, 30 years ago. Well, Nixon took us off the gold standard fully uh, uh, August 15th of 1971. So there were things that had to be done throughout the course of history in order to get us to where we're at today. But um, I I think now we're on, the the pedal is to the metal, we're on an accelerated path to destruction, and uh, people better buckle their seatbelts, you know. Maybe it was a lot of in terms of, uh, and I'll let you go right there, maybe I might be able to fit someone else in. Um, maybe it was just also with that, a watering down of the, mor- oh, it took a, the watering down of the morals of this country 
and I say that very, uh, you know, um, not not lightly. It's that they took to do to get to this point right here. It that's what it took. It took a few more generations and a few a couple more generations of the watering down of the morals and the te- and, and teaching and just looking around what people believe in this world and you know the abortions and this and just you know men marry men or whatever. It just it took that, and now we're to this point. Good point. And I'll let you go. You guys, Interesting. You guys, Thank you, guys, you. You guys both have a good night and God bless. God bless. Thank you. God bless you. You have a good night too, sir. Sometimes you can hear, you can almost hear the the wheels turning in my head, can't you? I mean, <laughs> yeah, hey, I mean, yeah. I do the same thing. Uh, I mean, like you said, they're very intellectually deep issues we're talking about, and they are important to think about. But in the in the long run, we could go back to before Jesus was born, and America. I mean, this could have played out in a completely different way with different players. Uh, it could have happened in a completely opposite way than it did, but the same plan and the same ending would come because it was finished before it began. But I, I, you know what, though, Joe? I think that... I, I, I really think if you take it back to the root, to the very root of where we're at, it, it did happen at the, begin, at the beginning of time. I, I think what we're, what we're seeing right now, the end game of good versus evil, of evil versus good, of the Luciferians, the, the uh, satanic, the, uh, you know, versus God. Um, that's where I think we're at right now. I think that we're, so that would put us in the end of days. So was this started um, with the, you know, with the angelic, throwing out of the war in heaven. I'll just simplify it by that. Um, yeah, it had to be. And that had to I be think known. that's true. Yeah, yeah. So, so, you know, if we're going back in time, yeah, we can go all the way back there. But if you look at everything that has gone on, um, doesn't it seem, ladies and gentlemen, that... that uh, it, everything has sped up. The events have sped up to the point now where it's just look at the news. I, 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 you're not going to be able to keep up. And, and that, that, by the way, is a big part of it. it it's a diversion upon a diversion upon a diversion. It's uh, one thing after another. It's, uh, um, but I, I do have this funny feeling. Uh, we're we're in for some surprises in the near term. I, I really believe that. Um, yeah. Some major surprises. Things are being sh- shaken up in all realms of life, whether it's monetary issues, family and moral issues, whether it is uh, our resources, our land, the rights that America has and Americans have versus the rest of the world, the level of poverty that they're falling into, the level of uh, starvations a year, the level of murders a year, abortions a year, everything is spinning out of control. Everything is manipulated and uh, switched around for the worse so that even food and water we consume are poison to our bodies when that is the opposite of how we were made and created and what we were supposed to ingest. They've turned all good into evil and all evil appears to be good now. And they've made things like church and Jesus not cool, where they made things like Luciferian music, the thing to want to aspire to be like. And when you have a generation of kids who don't have parental guidance and look up to these um, satanic musicians as role models, this is the generation in the world we live in from those consequences. No, I, I agree with you on that. And somebody says, just sent me a message here. You know, it, it could be two where the Illuminati, uh, Illuminati want us to <clears throat> excuse me want us to believe that we're in the end of days it, it's feasible where they could keep this going on for uh, you know a, a period of another several years perhaps but or, indicators and you're right they could make it appear right. but they could also try to hide that too and how bad it, it really is we have to remember one thing. 
one of the what is the first indicator that we are in, in the end times? Well, uh, go ahead. When Israel became a nation again. Oh, oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, <laughs> okay. Right. The reference to the generation um, shall not pass. Good point. But ninety seconds. What's the generation? Is it 70 years? Is it 100 years? Well, that's God's time, not ours. We are here to endure. We are here to spread the word until he says time is up. Until I mean, nobody knows what, when that is. Not even the angels in heaven. When, very very when, well when said. When the time is, is over. So We know the season, and the right. season is now. And, uh, boy, we're leaving you on that intellectual note. Thanks, Joe. And later this week, we're going to have Steve seconds. Coyle with Pastor Langford on Wednesday. We're going to have Stan Dale on Thursday. And um, I'm sure a guest or two might pop up in the meantime there. So with that, we'll leave you to tomorrow. God bless each and every one of you. Have a safe night. Keep the people in the storm and the people who were uh, affected by the, any storms, any problems, any uh, deaths to... Uh, the smallest endeavors and trials in your prayers. We should keep all of, all of us, each other, in our prayers at all times and be uplifting to all. We Amen. love each and every one of you. Have a good night and God bless. Good night. Thank you for using Blog Talk Radio.